week. The cars are running, and we're ready to probe the roots of American stock car racing. The high speeds and sophistication of Daytona three weeks ago, forgotten now, a distant memory. On the short tracks, the gloves come off. This race is going to be a street fight. Hello, everyone. I'm Dave Despain in the STP Pit Communications Center. Patrolling pit road today will be Chris Economaki and Jerry Garrett. And here to call the shots in the Richmond 400 is Ken Squire. Thank you, Dave. The major story for me this weekend is the man on the pole. One week ago, Rockingham, North Carolina, destroyed his car, went home, the entire crew working on 12 hours sleep, rebuilt the machine, same car, same engine, now sits on the pole. Wisconsin's Alan Kowicki, the man to watch here today. My colleague for this afternoon's race is a seven-year veteran of Winston Cup competition, former world karting champion, Lake Speed. Richmond Fairgrounds Raceway, a track with a history of excitement. And excitement in NASCAR racing translates into wrecks. There will be a lot of body work done at the end of this afternoon. You've got 32 perfectly prepared cars out there now, but they won't look that way when this race is over. The, the field rolling out for the start, and here's how they line up as we come to you live from Richmond today. The front row, Alan Kulwicki, Ford, and Harry Gant back in the front row for the first time since he was here a year ago. In row two, it's Dale Earnhardt and Jeff Bodine. For row three, Sterling Marlin and the 80 and 81 winner, Darrell Waltrip. In row four, Benny Parsons is there with Ricky Rudd. Going to row number five, Terry Labonte with his Chevrolet and Morgan Shepard. In row six, it's Bill Elliott and Rusty Wallace on this half mile. In row seven, Bobby Allison, winner in 74 and 83, and Mike Waltrip. Row eight is the six-time winner, Richard Petty, number 43, and the big surprise, Ken Schrader down at Daytona a few weeks past. Row nine, Tommy Ellis and Kyle Petty, defending champion. Row 10, Dave Marcus, a two-time winner, and Steve Christman. One more lap and they will be under green. In row 11, it's Davey Allison and Phil Parsons. For row 12 today, that's Jimmy Means and Neil Bonnet. Row 13, Eddie Bearswale and Buddy Arrington. Row 14, Bobby Hillen and Jerry Kramer in the number 64 car. Row 15, Slick Johnson in the number 12 and Bobby Woolwack. Those are provisional starters next. J.D. McDuffie in row 16 and D.K. Ulrich rounding out the field. Coming down for a start live at Richmond. Front row, the big story, Kulwicki jumps out in front with his board as he tears into turn number one, and Earnhardt, who wrecked yesterday, destroyed his car. They worked until 8 o'clock last night, pops into second place. Earnhardt in turn number one had a throttle hitch up, and away he went, hiking that number three into the wall. They've had no testing on the car since they knocked the front end off, and here they are. They brought three crew members back. Winston-Salem to work on the car, led by Cecil Gordon. Work is done. He's running second. Richard Childress told me this morning they intended to run this car for the lead right out of the box. Number seven, Colwicky. Remember, he took the whole rear end off the car just a week ago. But Cliff Champion and company have put him back in winning form. Out in front. Front three cars down in turn number one. It's 400 laps. The temperature today about 68 degrees. Very cloudy. And now you're with Benny Parsons. There you see the Superflow Exxon racer. That's the Folgers team with Benny Parsons in control. Started in seventh place today. Getting shuffled around in the early going. Maintaining seventh position directly in front of him in sixth is Darrell Waltrip. Front three. Bumper to bumper. Ford out in front. And then the Chevrolet second and third. What a story on Kulwicki. He's challenged by Earnhardt in turn four. Trying to dip underneath him. It's 40 feet wide in this main straightaway, 60 feet wide in the turns and on the back straightaway. It really funnels down as you come down these straightaways. Alan Kowicki's done an excellent job of hunting, standing up to the pressure right now that Dale Earnhardt is putting tremendous pressure on him. Ken Schrader comes in, I believe, a tire down at car number 90. Schrader beat Elliott by four inches, one of the 125-mile qualifiers, and a big favorite here, the Juni Donlevy car from Richmond on pit road, early stop. Appears he got into the wall there and got the car tire cut down. Kowicki continuing to stay out in front. The youngster who didn't even qualify here a year ago. Remember, he didn't make the show at Daytona, did not make Richmond. Actually, he was eighth fastest, but time trials weren't completed a year back before rain came down. And 
when it did, it sent him back on the hauler because they went to points to decide how they're going to line up the field, and he had to wait for another day. Allen's really at home on these short tracks. This is where he's cut his teeth. This is where he has his experience. The trader is back on the track. He was in 25 and 2 tenth seconds. Lost a couple of laps. Slowed down and coming in. He's two laps back. Still, Kowicki stays out in front. Kowicki very lucky to even be here. As we mentioned, they had 12 hours sleep on the week getting this car back together and coming to the track on Friday morning. One of the crew members fell asleep and they were in a collision with another car. Luckily, no one hurt. But it's been a tough week and they've come out on top thus far. Can they stay there for this Richmond 400? You can obviously see that Dale Earnhardt wants to put his car in the front. He's Ooh. trying everything he can possibly do to get by. Oh, and he spins right in front of Harry Gant. Earnhardt, in almost the area where he and Waltrip got in trouble, brings out the first caution of the day. This comes at lap nine. Cole Wickey, able to fend off Earnhardt. He'll go all the way to the rear of the field. He fires up. He's back underway. Look at this crowd on their feet. A lot of sentiment for Alan Kowicki. Gutsy kid out of the Midwest. Last night they honored him up in Wisconsin. He's here today. Didn't get home till 3 o'clock last night. Flying back in here. And there is no caution on the track. Yellow has not come out. No caution on the track. Lap 9 was the incident. And Earnhardt spun clear of the field. Although he was running in third place. The rest of the cars be able to meander around him as we look in replay at what happened there. This is when you want a you want a mile, but you only get an inch. You come up short. Kowicki just would not give ground. Absolutely, he held his ground, and just that's just from that good old tough short track experience that he's used to. So the Wisconsin University graduate holds off the first challenge by one of the toughest, Dale Earnhardt, and stays in front. We're back with you live once again at Richmond here on the Superstation, WTBS. Over the NBA. Now car number 55, Phil Parsons is on pit road. He's making a quick pit stop and coming out, losing a lap. Still, Kowicki stays in front on pit road. Editor, publisher, National Speed Sport News, Chris Economaki. Well, Kenny Schrader, the Daytona sensation, has had early bad luck here. He had to make a pit stop with a cut tire. It's a Richmond car and a Richmond owner. And now he is more than two laps down. Fortunately, this happened early in the race. He's going to have to work hard to get back. One little slip can do this to your car. Back to you, Ken. Kowicki going after the provisional starter. D.K. Ulrich at number six as he's into the back of the field. Incredible performance by the 1986 Rookie of the Year, Alan Kowicki. Staying out in front by about two and a half seconds now. Gant is second, Bodine third, Waltrip fourth, Marlon fifth, Benny Parsons sixth, Terry Labonte in seventh, Bill Elliott's eighth, Ricky Rudd is in ninth, Bobby Allison is maintaining tenth. Bill Elliott sliding back a little through the field right now. Yeah, he was doing it. He was trying to get a little ahead, but he wound up in the grass. Bill Parsons was in with that tire down, 14 and 6 tenths seconds. He's one and three quarters of a lap down in car number 55. Now you're back in that Superflow Exxon car, the Folgers racing team, with Benny Parsons carrying the onboard camera today. Down that start line, about 110 miles an hour here, into turn number one, right below the line. Picks it up out of turn number two. Now there's Bill Elliott in car number nine. Remember, he's in eighth place, and right behind him in ninth is Ricky Rudd as a couple of the Fords try to clamber through the field. The Fords off to an incredible start this year. Fords on the pole in the first three races of the year. Ford 87, Elliott at Daytona, Davey Allison, Rockingham. And it's the first time in the 39-year history of Winston Cup racing that Ford nameplates have grabbed the pole three times in a row at the start. Back at 65 with the Chrysler boycott, and with the GM not actively competing so much that year, they came. They had nine pole positions, but they didn't line up the first three. Car number 11 is on pit road. Terry Labonte, car number 11, gets in for a moment here. Meanwhile, as we watch the Alan Kowicki car, he's still drawing away in car number 7. Quick stop and back underway goes car number 11, the Junior Johnson team. He was in 11 and 110 seconds. It appears that the cut tire situation could play a big role in today's race. We've seen several of the contending cars go out so far on just cut tires alone. You just saw Buddy Arrington driving car number 81 today. Arrington is an 81 being overlapped by this car number 7, 
the brilliant Alan Kowicki, kid that got an engineering degree, and then back in 1980 he said, hey, I want to go racing. So he came up on the Midwest, went into the ASA. Here he is putting a mark on the Winkle car, number 70, J.D. McDuffie. He comes around him. There was a lot of people that were skeptical about Alan sitting on the pole here, thinking it might have been a fluke or something of this nature. And he has surely shown them there's no fluke in him sitting on the pole here today. Lake, are we into tire problems here? We've had four cars in for change of tires earlier. This running over things out there. I think that's from running over each other, Ken, not running over things. Here's Jerry Garrett. Well, you're seeing a tire that just came off Terry Labonte's car being rolled around and checked right now. This is on the left side. Apparently picked up a little something off the track, cut, and went flat. Thank you, Jerry. Tire's an issue for the moment here in the early going. Harry Gantstein, second, Bodine third. One of the critical things we're fixing to see right now is Dale Earnhardt is having to come up through lap traffic without the benefit of the wave over the blue flag because he is not leading. And in retrospect, Alan Kowicki has the wave over flag working to his advantage. We'll be interesting to see if Dale doesn't find himself a lap down shortly. One of the keys, Ken, and uh, Lake in this whole equation of the early part of the race is the initial car setup. Earnhardt was a particular problem, of course, because he literally tore the front end off that car in practice after his throttle hung open, and he stuck it into the fence running wide open. But all of the guys had a real guessing game to play here with the weather. Running this race traditionally the week after Daytona, it's always cool when they come here. The weather this week has been very, very warm, and so the track is a lot more slippery. The cars weigh 200 pounds less. That's a difference. This is the first time we've seen them on the short track. Everybody was playing a guessing game going in as to how to set up the car. Colwicki obviously had the perfect setup for practice, and they've gotten it right for the start of the race. But the key to remember is this. This racetrack will change constantly, all day long, and they'll fiddle with that setup. They'll change the suspension. They'll change the tires. They'll adjust the way the car works. And at the end of 400 laps, the guy who has played that guessing game the best all day long is going to win it. Got a real squabble here. Third place, Bodine and Waltrip are into it pretty strong. Waltrip looks like he has the horses. They're there definitely it is. getting after each other there. That's short track racing out of two contenders that are wanting to make their bid early in this race. Third place battle, Bodine, number five, down to the inside, Waltrip trying to make the move. This one could be a squabble all day between these two veterans of short track competition. It's Richmond, Virginia, where we're live today on the Superstation, bringing you one of the great racing classics. $339,000 at stake here today. I'm in Richmond, Virginia, where the Richmond 400 is just getting underway, and Alan Kulwicki has written his name all over this race. That started in Bush Pole qualifying when the front row of Kulwicki and Earnhardt was set, and it was a very eventful qualifying session. Let's have a look at some of that activity from the qualifying run. The guys had a little bit of difficulty out here. This is Neil Bonnet coming off turn four. Boom! Tags that outside fence. Little problem for Neil. But he wasn't the only guy with his share of difficulties. Again, turn four, the bugaboo. As Bill Holler comes out, misses the fence, but he got her completely sideways. Look at this. He won't touch a thing. Saved the car, but didn't qualify for the race. How about Ron Shepard? He comes off four. He missed the turn four fence. Looked like he was in good shape, but when he got to turn one, things got ooh, real complicated. He, too, did not make the race and tore up the car. The guy who did it right, well, it was Alan Kulwicki. Here he comes to start the quickest lap of the qualifying weekend, and we can't repeat, I don't think, often enough, the fact that Kulwicki is running the same car that he literally destroyed just a week ago at Rockingham. This crew came here with that rebuilt car, and as they came thundering down to the finish line at the end of qualifying, they had set the fastest lap of the day. Kulwicki starts from the bush pole, and he has stayed there all the way. Let's get back to the action. Stop. Sophomore Jinx Bowie, here he is, Cole Wicke, the youngster. Rookie of the year, now being challenged by Harry Gant as he comes around to complete the 38th lap, and he's led all the way thus far. But Harry Gant is looking very strong, and of course, Emmanuel Zervakis now working on car number 33, knows Richmond as well as he knows any track on the circuit. He and Travis Carter trying to bring this one home. Harry very pumped up for this race, and I might add, the other guy who looked really strong to me Rusty Wallace. Wallace nearly going right now. Wallace's car is not showing up in the top 10 or in the top 12, but he looked good in practice late yesterday. We'll just have to see how this thing resolves. There he is, Rusty Wallace, and right behind him is Kyle Petty. 
Morgan Shepard. There's the 27 car. Back with the leaders again. Morgan Shepard just pitted, and I believe that's the fourth and fifth car we saw come in for a tire, but it's more serious on Morgan's car. He has now gone back to the garage area. Now there is Sterling Marlin in that Oldsmobile directly in front of Benny Parsons. And they are fighting for fifth position. You're riding with Benny Parsons, the Folgers Racing Team, Harry High crew chief. Benny taking over for Tim Richmond. We'll file a story a little later on here on Tim Richmond, out out in Florida, watching the race today. Tim, hope you're feeling better. Car number 44 stays right there. That is the battle for fifth. Marlin is fifth. Parsons is sixth. Elliott maintaining seventh. Benny trying to find some running room here. It's been a long time since he's run and won on the short track back in the 70s. He won a Richmond 400, he being Benny Parsons the man with whom you're riding in that Folgers car. Back with the leaders again. And there you see the interval between car number seven and the green and white number 33 of Harry Gant, who sat on the pole here last September. I think right now that, that uh, Harry and, and, and Allen are setting a pace that they're comfortable with. They're trying just to work through this traffic so things can kind of thin down. Harry kind of got up there behind him and gave him a hard push here for a little while. I think he saw that it would be too difficult to try to get by, too risky this early. Waiting on it. Let's go to Chris Economaki. I'm down here in Alan Kowicki's pit with his crew chief, Cliff Champion. Take a long look. What's he saying on the radio, Cliff? Well, right now, the car is just a little bit loose coming off the corner. Not much, just a tick. Other than that, he's doing good. He made an adjustment at his first stop. Well, we might try and try to change this to stagger on the first stop and see how it goes from there. Okay, there you have it from Alan Cole, which is number one in the Pitts Club champion. Champion who just came with that team at the last moment before the season started. He's got a magic hand, as does uh, Jeff Chandler, who was with him, Kowicki, a year ago. And they have done just remarkable things. Here he is on the pole, the cream of the crop in qualified, number seven. Gerald Kowicki watching up in Wisconsin today. The father of Allen, who used to build racing engines and built some darn good ones over the years. In fact, his engines won six United States Auto Club titles for guys like Norm Nelson and Roger McCluskey a few years back. But his son is just tearing this field up right now. Staying with him is Harry Gant in the second position. And then the interval back to third is about 30 car lengths to where you find Jeff Bodine, followed by Waltrip fourth, Marlon fifth, Parson sixth, Elliott seventh, Ricky Rudd eighth, Bobby Allison in ninth, Richard Petty tenth, Tommy Ellis from Virginia 11th, 12th is Dave Marcus, 13th is now Rusty Wallace, 14th is Kyle Petty, 15th is Michael Waltrip, 16th Davey Allison. Right now, from Sterling Marlin on back is a freight train with some of the fiercest battling going on you've ever seen. And 33 trying to make a move here. Gant comes down on the inside. Now, Gant is an old-fashioned street fighter on these tracks. Look at car number 75 trying to get a lap back. Remember, he was in for an early tire change. Neil Bonnet in that 75. And he is trying to get himself around those two fellows and get himself back up in that lap. I believe he's two down. Jerry Garrett. Yeah, Ken Squire, we're down here right now with Kenny Bernstein, the owner of the Quaker State Buick, the Morgan Shepherd driving. What's wrong with it? Well, unfortunately, we broke a third member, a ratchet in the third member. We're going to change it and get him back in the race. Any of this damage on the back fender here have anything to do with that? Well, you never know. He probably got hit in the back and broke the ratchet part, but you don't know. It's just one of those things that happens. We're not happy about it. Leaders in heavy traffic. Bill Parsons directly in front of Kowicki approaching turn number one. Live on the half mile here in Richmond, Virginia. Ah, and there goes Gant down to the bottom of the racetrack. Kowicki not wanting to give ground, stays out there. There's a lot of ripples down to the bottom of turn number two, a lot of bumps. And if you can get through them, you can make a move. Here they come once again, closing up. Bill Parsons down to the bottom of the track in the 55 car. Better than 100 miles an hour in his main straightaway. Again to the inside. Gant trying to find some room. Shoves his nose up under number seven. Puts the tire mark on the white and red Ford. Parsons hanging tough on the bottom of the racetrack. And now Kowicki on the high side moves around. Pulls up on Bobby Wolak in the 74. This is a problem on the short track sometimes. It's just hard to get by that lap traffic. And while you're sitting there struggling to get by them, a guy can take advantage of you and pick on you. 
back straightaway. Car number 90 was almost trapped in those lap cars. Ken Schrader almost going to lap down to these two. He's only, a, there you see him, just a few car lengths in front of the first two or he'll be a lap down. And everybody figured they'd come in here tough today. Bob Johnson, a good short track builder. Yeah, I get it to you. Kenny can feel their breath on him right now. He said, please give me a caution, but don't let it be me. Why haven't we had cautions? We thought there'd be a, a few ripples and rumples out here by now. And these cars and a couple of cautions in the early going. Well, we saw some aggressive driving at the first. I think that's where those cut tires came from. There was a lot of fenders pushed in on tires and cut. But these guys know that they've got to finish 500 miles. 400 laps. 400 laps here to, to make the race. I mean, you can't win it by sitting in the garage here. Say the guy on the move, uh, Tommy Ellis, he started back in 17th, and Lake they now show him up to 11. I'll tell you what, I watched Tommy yesterday afternoon. He was one of the best cars consistently in late practice that I saw on the track. He told me he couldn't get a set of tires to work together. He was terribly frustrated both Friday and, and yesterday morning. Apparently got the combination late yesterday afternoon. Now there's that battle for the lead, which continues to be a dandy, and there's Schrader in number 90, the Don Levy car. About to go, a lap down, if Alan Kowicki has his say. Gant, again, scoots back to the bottom of the track. Here he is in that rough turn number two. Heavy vibration. That's right where Neil Bonnet had that terrible crash and impaled his car right through the fence he went before he was done. Alan Kowicki, Wisconsin University engineering graduate who decided the only thing he wanted to do was go racing. Proved himself in the Midwest. Then loaded every possession he had in the world in the back of a pickup truck and one year ago came south. And what a remarkable job this young, cool customer has done. One thing we can't forget about is Dale Earnhardt. He is steadily moving away and gaining that distance back away from Allen and the rest of the field. They're fighting with these slow cars, and Dale seems to be able to get right through the traffic a little cleaner. Nary a sign of a caution flag thus far. We're 59 laps deep in two. The Richmond 400 live on the Superstation. Kowicki in front. Harry Gant banging on the back bumper in second place. Whoop. Sunday afternoon in Richmond, Virginia. You can go for a wild Sunday afternoon ride here with Benny Parsons in the sixth place automobile here in the Richmond 400. Hasn't driven one of these races for five years. We said Alan Kowicki has his name all over this race. After 60 laps, he was leading the True Value Hard Charger standing. Here's how it works. The True Value Hardware people keep track of the hard chargers, the guys who run at the front of the pack. Five points to lead a lap, four for second, three for third, so on down. They keep score all day long. At the end of the race, cash bonuses for the hard chargers. Kulwicki has led every lap of the Richmond 400 thus far. Again, until right now. And as you saw, Harry Gann put that right fender right in the door of Kowicki, moved him out of the line about six feet, just shoved him up, and they both are now moving around car number 90, Schrader. Schrader was the key car in that little altercation. Gant knew he had enough power, but he just couldn't deal with Kowicki, and he finally got him boxed and was able to get around. So car number 33, Harry Gant, has just taken the lead. 68 laps are now complete. There they are, lapping the number 67 car, which is Buddy Arrington owned and driven by Eddie Beardswell from Texas today. That's, I think, just a case of pure experience on this racetrack. Harry used that slow traffic to his advantage to get by, now he's on the race. Let's take a look at that pass for the lead in replay. There's the 90 down there. Now watch this move by Gann. As the 90 comes up, he puts the 7 in the box for the moment, and it gives just enough room. Him a nice Harry Gudge there. Stick his nose in there and then use the back of the car. Not the front, but the back. That's what you call throwing the block. Throwing the what? Because they pushed him out and then threw a block. Car number 33. Harry Gant, the leader of the Skull Bandit. Didn't have a win all of last year. Desperate for a win to get back in that winner's circle program. Hal Needham here from California. This is the Burt Reynolds. Hal Needham, number 33. Boy, they really want to put this one together. They've worked hard on this track. Earnhardt, now 15th. There he is, just climbing up underneath Mike Waltrip, closing on Dave Marcus. He's only half a lap behind. Remember that early altercation he had with Alan Kowicki. He's gathered himself back up. And the old Iron Man, Earnhardt, is on the roll, continuing to clip through cars. Closes up on number 71, Dave Marcus, the two-time winner of this race. Here he is just gliding out of that corner. That's turn number four, down the main straightaway. Let's see if he's going to deal on the outside. Marcus down low. 
he has new sponsorship on there. Everybody's getting washed up these days. All cleaned up. On the outside, Earnhardt presses in turn three. And give him another spot as he continues to unlimber the Richard Childress car. That the car, car that was wrecked two days ago. That car is really working good on the outside. That's a tremendous advantage here at Richmond because the track gets so slick, most of the guys want to hug the inside lane. They leave the outside lane wide open to a guy that's car works on the outside. Number 18, that's Tommy Ellis. Ellis's car, now you're watching the scramble. This is for 11. As he's dealt with Mike Waltrip, he's dealt with Marcus. He's on a roll for 11th spot now and making it. At the rate he's going right now, it won't be long before he'll be back in the top five. Dale Earnhardt ready to pop into the top ten, trying to win the championship for the second year in a row after that magnificent performance of 1986. Are there any difficulties for Earnhardt, 87, racing team? Our biggest problem is uh, just... Uh, you know, being tough, uh, being consistent, just uh, the guys are too eager sometimes. Uh, they, they get in there and work hard, and, uh, you know, we just can't wait to get to the racetrack. Uh, we're awful impatient to get here and, and start racing and do good. And, uh, you know, uh, our, our time, our fun time is uh, race day. For 10th place, this is the time right now for Earnhardt. Bottom side, turn one, slams it and touches the brake. Moves Ricky Rudd at Chesapeake, Virginia, up the little on the outside. Tries to get him again. Dives to the bottom, and the Chevrolet pulls the Ford. Here comes Earnhardt. Up still, another spot. Ricky Rudd falls to 11th. Earnhardt goes to 10th. Further up in the field, Bobby Allison has just moved around Benny Parsons. Parsons relegated back to 7th. Bobby Allison up to 6th. Now there's the number 27 car. That's Rusty Wallace. He's now in ninth. He scoots down to the inside of Bill Elliott. Look at this scramble. Elliott's there in eight. Rusty Wallace with the bear, number 27. And out back the yellow and blue colors of the Childress Racing Team of Winston-Salem. On the inside, Missouri's Rusty Wallace. And one of the fastest men alive, Bill Elliott. Austin Bill from Dawsonville holding on. What an incredible 210-mile-an-hour lap he turned at Daytona. But then you come to Richmond. But for the first time in three years, they didn't come to Richmond. Eight inches of snow came instead. So a couple of weeks late, here we are. A record crowd is congregated. Here comes Childress making the move on Elliott. Great scramble. And still coming up through traffic comes Richard, Richard Childress's car with Dale Earnhardt in number three, just down on the bottom side. Oh, that's tight running. A Richard Childress team. What a magnificent combination with Cecil Gordon assisting out there. Lula Rose in the engine man with his car number three and Earnhardt. It all comes together, and they've stuck together for a couple of years. Wallace comes back on the inside beneath Elliott. And that puts Earnhardt in the number three car into eighth position and back again into ninth. That is Bill Elliott. Here's your leader, number 33, Harry Gant. Gant in the 33 gets himself a pretty fair advantage out here right now. He's really enjoying a clear track right now, and he'll try to take advantage of this situation and draw on away and get him some running room so he can deal with that slower traffic at his own leisure instead of having to rush through it. And in the second spot is car number seven, Alan Kowicki. And we've seen a change also. Darrell Walter has been working on Jeff Bodine for quite some time, and he has finally gotten by as well. Jerry Garrett. Again down here in Alan Kowicki's pit, you see they move tires up against the fence here. They're anticipating a pit stop. They'd like to get a yellow, but leading those 60-some-odd laps has taken a toll on Alan Kowicki's tires. Now they're up to 84 laps. 84 laps now complete. This is a great start to this race. A year ago, but it's time we had four or five cautions. Not the case today. Two or three cars through the fence. <laughs> yeah. Running a harder of the same tire they've run before and 200 pounds less weight now there's Darrell Walton car number 17 just in front of Bodine and here's Chris Akonabaki well with 85 laps in the books we checked up and down pit road almost everyone is saying their drivers are complaining about handling problems except for one Dal Walton he says his car is perfect except there's too much traffic out there there's only one car out of the race 31 cars on this half mile track which makes for a lot of traffic 
I think that caution issue is very key here, Ken. We ought to talk about that. Over the last three years, there have been an average of nine caution periods in this race, and it's crucial for the drivers and the pit crews because those caution periods are when they work on the cars. Waltrip setup may be perfect, but you can bet your bottom dollar that virtually every car out there needs some sort of an adjustment after 80 laps of running around this racetrack. The track changes, the car changes, those tires go away, and they need those pit stops under yellow, those comparatively leisure periods on pit road when the field is slowed down to make those adjustments. They're not getting to make them here. As we said earlier, it was a guessing game going in, and now you're having to live with the guess that you made at the top of the race because there's been no yellow flag. And we could very well see a record race pace if this continues. Can't first, Kulwicki second, Waltrip third, Bodine fourth. Here's the story. It's still Dale Earnhardt. He is now in sixth, and Bobby Allison is running just in front of him. Richard Petty almost sliding into the wall down in turn number two. I think he did tag the wall, but he kept right on trucking. Still no caution. 89 laps complete. Here you see Bobby Allison, car number 22, being challenged by Earnhardt down to the bottom in turn one. This is the struggle now for fifth position. Bobby Allison, number 22, in fifth. Dale Earnhardt, six. Putting a lap on DK Ulrich. Half mile, Richmond live on the Superstation today. Here's Earnhardt closing in, looking for some room now, and he's got it. Boy, they both take a high line. That means the tires are beginning to go away on those cars. You see them come out that far. Nobody's getting sticky on the bottom. That's part of it, too, but Dale's car's working, and several of the other cars are working. It seems right on that ridge of the dirty part of the track, right out to the berm, as the guy would say, on a, on a dirt track. Earnhardt trying to deal with Bobby Allison, a two-time winner on this track. Harry Gann, at number 33, maintaining his lead by some 25 car lengths over Alan Kowicki in second spot. Waltrip third, Bodine fourth, Bobby Allison in fifth. Here at Richmond. The sellout at Richmond Fairgrounds Speedway. This old racetrack jammed to the gunnels, and this is the kind of action they're watching. From the in-car camera, the battle as these cars storm around this little half-mile oval. We're in the STP Pit Communication Center. Not a whole lot happening in the pits today. It's all been out on the racetrack. Haven't had a caution flag yet. Two-car race up front. Gann and Colwicky swapped the lead once, but behind them, Daryl Waltrip, who's won it a couple of times, and he knows the key to this race is the last lap and not the first hundred. And further back in the field, Dale Earnhardt continuing a tremendous charge. Those are the stories we're following here, approaching the midway point in our Valvoline Midway's recap. Let's go back to Ken. Yeah, that mid-race recap just 100 laps away. First quarter down, nary a sign of a caution flag out here. And right now, the moves being made in this track are by this man, Harry Gant, in car number 33, out in front. He has a pretty fair advantage over this man in second place, car number 7. And there you see third and fourth, the 17 and 5 cars of Darrell Waltrip and car number 5, Harry Gant. Or rather, number 5, Jeff Bodine. Further back in the field, the Allison scramble with Earnhardt continues to be a war. Now, there's Richard Petty's number 43. There's the number 33 car. Take a look at Petty's right rear panel here. That's where he decked the fence just a few moments ago and kept right on moving. That happened right there in turn two, where he is at this moment. He swapped the wall with the rear end of the car and continues to motivate that Pontiac. It's been interesting to note as the tires have worn down and the race has gone on, how the traffic has moved out to the outer lanes. The faster cars are the cars that seem to be able to run right at the edge of the dirty part of the racetrack. That's what we call the green part of the track. It doesn't have the oil, it doesn't have the tire rubber and everything ground into it as much yet, and you get a better adhesion out there. Harry Gant continues to steady the pace. All of them beginning, when are they going to come in for tires? When would be the right time now? About 40 laps away, half mile track? With the 200 pound weight reduction right now, it's anybody's guess as to what's going to be the situation. Nobody knows. This is the first time to run on a short track with this lighter weight. Let's check into that battle with Bobby Allison in the fifth position, number 22, and the number three of Earnhardt. Now remember that Earnhardt is tied in the Winston Cup point standing with Bill Elliott at 345 points each. They're worth about $2 million this year. So these little tracks are where they really make the difference. You can win a lot of big races, as Elliott did a couple of years back, but he did not do so well in the short tracks, and that will be your Achilles heel. You must do well on half miles like here and Martinsville, Virginia, the Bristol track, North Wilkesboro, 
the telling story on the championship season. Here's Chris Economac. We checked up and down Pitt Road about what the 200 pound weight reduction means. It's interesting. Uh, Kenny Schrader said everything tastes better, and Benny Parsons says he can't tell the difference. We've got two drivers out there now, Bobby Allison and Dale Earnhardt, who are Tigers, and are going to take advantage of every little bit of, it, of that 200 pounds. The cars were in the corners deeper, and the tires last a little bit longer. They're going to get the most out of it as much as they can. Well, I'll tell you, this is a bit surprising. Here we are, a fourth of the way through. There has not been a caution flag back in 1960 and in 1970. They ran this event with only one caution. That's the record, and it's still pretty clear thus far. There's Richard Petty's car. He gets around. Even though that car got hit, he's trying to get a, he's trying to stay with the leader. He's trying to put a lap on him. Meanwhile, further back, the 22 and the 3 continues to be a tremendous war here this afternoon. Here they are. Dale Earnhardt was really moving up through the field until he got to Bobby Allison, and there the uh, march had stopped. And let's not forget Rusty Wallace. At fifth, six, and seven. Allison in the 22 is fifth. Earnhardt is running six, and Rusty Wallace is in seventh position. The Barry Dotson prepared car. D.K. Ulrich comes down the main straightaway very slowly, about 35, 40 miles an hour, looking almost like a pace car. You see him on the bottom of the track here. That's another one running low on the bottom, and right behind him is the number six car. I think Rusty Wallace is really taking advantage of the war that's going on between Allison and Earnhardt to close the gap. A lot of people don't like this racetrack. And we asked Dale Earnhardt how he felt about Richmond. I like it. I like it for that reason. Uh, you know, a lot of them try to go too hard at this racetrack. Uh, I think it's a racetrack you got to play and work and uh, make it work to your advantage. Uh, it'll get slick off the corners. And, uh, you know, these guys like Waltrip and... Uh, uh, Rudd will get around here good, and uh, those, those are the guys I'm, I'm looking at having the race on Sunday, and uh, hopefully we can get our car tuned in, and I use my head good, good enough to get around here and get around fast and uh, beat one, one of the cars to beat. The 1985 winner, Dale Earnhardt. Looks right now, uh, Alan Kowicki is uh, starting to have a little more competition with him right now. Darrell and uh, Jeff Bodine are both closing in and starting to put the pressure on Alan as well. Right? Indeed, the battle is beginning to develop up there for second place. We'll check on that in a moment. We keep watching as we see number 33 here again. Earnhardt looks like he has the power to move on Allison, but he can't dispatch him. The handle just doesn't seem to be quite there at this time. And, oh, a spin. That's number 67 all the way around, looping, and there's the first caution right here in the main straightaway. Mike Waltrip getting trapped right behind him. Eddie Bearswell. First caution in this straightaway that's only 40 feet wide. They try to make it three deep. That was some of the best driving I've ever seen out of a bunch of guys in my life. On a half mile. On really a half to mile to have somebody block the front straightaway and nobody wipe a car out. Caution is out. First time this afternoon in replay. This came at lap 113. There's the number 22 car running in fifth position and sixth and seventh and right behind them a couple of laps down. Eddie Bearswell spinning. Watch what happens behind it. The issue is not the spin. Usually it collects three or four cars in those multiple car wrecks on this track. And this is where it could have got really nasty. Mike Waltrip is already hard on the brakes and slowing down. Jerry Garrett. We're down here right now, Ken and Harry Gantz, and they're changing all four tires on this car. They're not making a chassis adjustment as yet. He's one of the first in, but he's going to have a hard time getting out from behind the number 11 of Terry Labonte. He's back out now. And what? Chris Economaki. Okay, Alan Kowicki has had to go to reverse gear to get out of the pits after changing all four tires, getting his windshield clean, and a cool drink, and he's calm, cool, and collected at the wheel as he goes back on the track. 115 laps have been completed. First caution of the day is a tremendous break for all the teams. More live on the Super Back on the track, and the man out in front is Bobby Allison, Harry Gantt second, Waltrip third, Earnhardt fourth. Let's get a GM Goodwrench Motorsports update. Here's Bob Barsha. Thanks, Ken. Hello, everyone. We'll take a little pause here and change the scene. This is one of the biggest weekends of the motorcycle racing season here in the U.S., and the action this weekend is all in Daytona Beach, Florida. 
Texan Kevin Schwanz has the pole for this afternoon's big Daytona 200 Superbike race. But the real story in Daytona is former world champion Freddie Spencer. Coming back off an injury-wracked 1986 season, Spencer was hoping to get in and win the 200, but he crashed hard in practice, broke his collarbone and a couple of ribs. No word on how long fast Freddie Spencer is going to be out in 87. Now, this has been a very busy weekend for Alan Kulwicki. After winning the pole for today's race here in Richmond, Kulwicki was flown by NASCAR back to his home state of Wisconsin to spend the evening with the folks who know him best. The annual Wisconsin Fans for Auto Racing Awards banquet attracted a sellout crowd of over 400 Saturday night to honor native son and NASCAR Rookie of the Year Alan Kowicki on Alan Kowicki Day, though the guest of honor almost didn't make it. Because the race at Richmond was postponed, we had to make special arrangements to, to be here for this awards banquet Saturday night. And uh, it meant a little something extra special to me because the governor did proclaim it Alan Kowicki Day in Wisconsin. But when I, when I knew I was going to come back here to get this award, I certainly never thought I'd be coming back as a pole sitter for the Miller 400 at Richmond. And that, that really just makes it a great weekend for me so far. Congratulations to Alan Kowicki. We'll have more stock cars, drag racing, off-road racing, and more in our next edition of the GM Goodwrench Motor Week Illustrated Racing Update. Next time by, 120 laps will have been completed as we watch Davey Allison. Now, this is not a short track car. This from the Harry Rainier Lundy team is one of their long trap cars converted. And they're just trying to get some experience here at Richmond. Let's go to Chris Economaki. You may wonder why these drivers uh, escape from these sideswiping episodes out on the racetrack. One of the reasons is the NASCAR mandated sidebars and the construction of the car. Inside of every Winston Cup car are the safety bars that inside the door to protect the driver and also to let them keep going after these minor fender bending incidents. Back to you, Ken. On the restart, the lineup is this. Allison first, Gant second, Walker third, Earnhardt fourth, Kowicki fifth, Bodine sixth. Parsons is in seventh, Sterling Marlin eighth, Rusty Wallace ninth, Dave Marcus tenth, Bill Elliott eleventh, Richard Petty in twelfth, Ricky Rudd thirteenth, and Tommy Ellis is in fourteenth. Lap cars dropping to the inside, fast cars on the outside. Cars in that lead lap as we get ready to turn them loose. Another time here at Richmond today in this Richmond 400 before a sellout crowd. Temperature in the 60s, no sign of rain until this evening, they say. And on the break, Bobby Allison scooting around the Morgan Shepherd car several laps down, gets himself just a little bit of a breather from car number 33, Harry Gant, who looks as tough as he's been at some time. very well, practiced very well, and set the thing on the jack stands and waited for the race to start. 123 laps are complete. Bobby Allison out in front, making a beautiful run here today. Morgan Shepard trying to take a lap back. He's several down. Here's Gant getting around on the outside, and Darrell Waltrip. Right behind Waltrip comes his old pal from this race. One year ago, car number three, Earnhardt. They headed out on the last lap in the last series of corners, destroyed each other's automobiles on this racetrack last year at this time. Now here comes, there's Schrader back in the pits. This will cost him a lap and car number 90 and back underway. Meanwhile, up in front, Gant in the 33 is definitely making some moves on Bobby Allison, the two-time winner. And down to the inside comes Earnhardt in number three, closing in a Waltrip four-car battle for the lead. Look at Earnhardt muscling down to the ripple strip, that bouncy section of turn number two, and Earnhardt is up in the third spot. He closes it on that leader. Here is Earnhardt closing up on number 33, Harry Gant. Gant closes it on Allison. Something's got to give. Gant wants the outside now. Looks out there, leaves a big opening. Let's see if Earnhardt can move to the inside. Whoa, back in the dirt. There goes car number three, and he's got the spot. And in trouble is Harry Gant in the fence. Earnhardt diving down right where the same kind of incident happened a year ago with Waltrip. The number 33 collects the fence, and there's a caution out for the second time today. There's no doubt about it. The man wants to win this race. That will not make him an all-time most popular driver here at Richmond. I doubt that very seriously, that's for sure. I think Terry Labonte just made an outstanding move and we're getting a lap back. Let's take a look and replay at what happened here. 
turn three. Down to the inside. Gets the shoulder inside, and Gant tries to collect it once, twice. It goes away. That was an unfortunate thing for Harry, but in actuality, he came off very good. Very lucky. Absolutely. He could have really torn that one up. So we're under caution for the second time today after an altercation between Dale Earnhardt and the bandit Harry Gant. Going to be more to that story. We're back with you live at Richmond on the restart. Earnhardt getting up and moving around. Bobby Allison. Allison, the 83 and 74 winner, now finds himself in second position here this afternoon. And Dale Earnhardt, the 1985 winner, is out in front trying to draw away. Walter third. Odine fourth, and Benny Parsons has picked up a couple of spots. He's in fifth. Well, for a car that was wrecked on Friday, it certainly comes out of the box strong on Sunday. No practice yesterday whatsoever. They spent the entire day rebuilding this machine, and it doesn't miss a beat. I'll tell you, it's a real credit to a crew in their preparation because those guys knew what they needed to win here, and that's what they put underneath the car. There you see the number three car on this half-mile track. $339,000 at stake, sellout crowd for over a week in Richmond, Virginia. And Darrell Waltrip is coming to the front, too. I think he's had all the back that he wants. He's going out trying to get clear. Down to the turn number one. That's number three. Out in front, the battle is building for second place. As the 17 and the 22 continue to have their own war. Great battle going on. Let's go to Chris Economaki. I'm here with Kirk Shelmerdine, Dale Earnhardt's crew chief. What did you do to the car on that stop, Kirk? We put in some new tires on there. He used the first half pretty badly. He's like a new car. Well, tires helped everybody a little bit. We spun out on that first set there and had to really run him hard to run through all that traffic. So uh, the new set really was what he needed. What's he saying on the radio? He's not saying much right now. Okay, thank you very much. Taylor Earnhardt's crew chief, looking happy. Second place battle continues to be a dandy. Allison on the outside, Walker on the inside. The high line has been working for Allison, but now Walter gets a little bit of the advantage. Here comes Bodine moving into it. When the new tires, we've got fresh tires, most of the guys will try to get back on the low part of the track, run a short distance around. As soon as the tires' temperatures come on up, then they want to get conservative with the tires. They'd rather run that longer, long, wider line that doesn't abuse the tires as much, so they can run more laps consistent. There's Bodine down on the inside trying to work on Allison, and he is getting there. Jeff Bodine, bottom of the racetrack, Bobby Allison alongside. Morgan Shepard several laps down to the green and white car. Good scramble going on as Allison continues to ride the high side and on the inside. Number five, Jeff Bodine from Chemung, New York, moves that car through. Now Morgan Shepard takes a shot. The Bernstein car with Morgan Shepard at the controls comes down low. They were having their problems earlier and thought after yesterday's late practice that this race might go their way. Not so. There's several laps down. Richard Petty. In that car number 43, I think he has now lost the lap. Whoa, tight rotting here as Morgan Shepard stuffs it down to the bottom of the racetrack and uses up a little. Whoa, right into the wall goes Shepard, and he collects Allison. A multiple crash coming out of turn number four. Three, four, five cars, including car number 35. With our in-car camera, you can see what his vision is like. Nil, zero. Tommy Ellis is in it, Phil Parsons, Ricky Rudd. You might get lucky once, but it's doubtful you'll get that lucky twice. So after we went 100 laps, full green, we have three cautions in a row, and take a look at this. Neil Bonnet collected in that crash as well. Now there from the in-car camera, from that Superflow Exxon car, Richard Petty comes in, and he's in real trouble. Right front wheel on Petty's car looks to be broken off. Circulating around the track is the number 35. You're riding for the moment with Parsons there. He wants to get in and get that hood taken care of. You can see Richard Petty's wheel broken. Here's the car where it began. Morgan Shepard's number 26. He has a right, rear, right wheel broken. In comes number 35, Parsons, to get his hood worked on. And we'll be back with more from Richmond, Virginia. Get them all. 
here in Richmond, Virginia. The annual Richmond 400 has just had its major event of the day. There you see the Benny Parsons car back on pit road, and there's a big story developing on this car, number 35. You see the hood finally being removed, and I think he has run a stop sign, and they may hold him here for a moment in that Superflow Exxon car, number 35. Now there's Bobby Allison's car, number 22, that's been banged up some. He's back on the track, and let's look and replay and how all this came about. There you see that Morgan Shepard car right across the front of Elliott, into the wall, bounces back, collects the Allison car. The hood comes up on Benny Parsons' machine. You can see the 55 spinning and crashing there, Phil Parsons. The number 75 gets nailed, and who sails right through the middle of it? Number seven, Alan Kowicki, came out without a bruise. Now, this is the view from Benny Parsons' car of that incident. Coming down the main straightaway, cars everywhere. As he comes through, the hood gets nailed. You could see the camera taking a terrible shock there, the hood bouncing up, as all of a sudden he had cars all over the front of car number 35. Tim Richmond has been the driver for Rick Hendrick last year and gave them such a dramatic finish with those seven great victories. Tim Richmond certainly the man to beat in 86, but this year, so far, he's among the missing. In this exclusive interview, he told us about his winter of misfortune. Tim Richmond has lived his life on the edge. High-speed boats, personal appearances, a budding acting career kept him on the run when he wasn't winning races. Then last winter, it all went terribly wrong. I ran myself ragged and, and, and got sick with the flu or whatever they wanted to call it and didn't do anything about it. Continued to do as much as I could, doing the interviews, doing appearances here and there. Tried to do, I just missed out the, on the Willie Nelson Farm Made Golf Tournament. Tried to do that. And uh, it basically, it, it turned into pneumonia, and I still didn't do anything about it. And it finally just, it, it run, I run myself totally out of gas. You know, I've been known to drive it, drive something till the wheels fall off. Well, I drove, I drove myself to where the, to every wheel and fell off, including the steering wheel, and I couldn't do anything more about it. The bout with double pneumonia that almost killed him changed his off-track perspective. He's quick to cite examples. Well, example, my family. You know, I've always been close to them um, in a way, but in another way, I, you know, I spent more time figuring out how to get away from them than I did how to, how to my mom. be close to them. And now I'm going to take the important things and, and I'm going to take time for myself and my family and, and do what I think is right. The old drive has returned. Tim is focused on total recovery and a comeback. He chose Southern Florida as a place to recuperate and focus on the future. With the way things are, uh, I'm shooting for the for the May race, at least the Winston, because it's a shorter race, and it's a, it would be a it wouldn't be such a, a dramatic test for me to see if I can withstand the 500 miles or 600 miles when I come back. So I would say the the Winston's my my shot at it. Uh, but, but it's not for sure, because I don't know how the training's going to work out, and and I don't know, you know, I don't know how the recovery period, if it's going to be a long period or a short period. But. Questions still linger over the timetable, but with Tim Richmond, there is no question he will come back a winner. I'm not making a comeback to make a comeback. I'm making a comeback to to win. Tim Richmond, tough guy, come back soon. Let's take a look and replay again at what has happened here to bring out this caution period. There you see Morgan Shepard's car into the wall. Allison, no place to go, trips up Richard Petty. That trips up Parsons. It trips up the 75 car of Neil Bonnet, Phil Parsons, Ricky Rudd, Ellis, and right through all of it comes number seven, Alan Kowicki, straight as a die, made about two moves to the steering wheel that carried him through. Well, it's right. your day, it's your day. How about that? And if it's not, <laughs> some days it's diamond, that. some days it's stone. 152 laps are complete. 152, they're back under green as they break. Waltrip is in front. Bodine is in second. In third is Bill Elliott. Fourth is Earnhardt. 
Maintaining fifth, Alan Kowicki, sixth, Gant, seventh, Marlin, eighth, Marcus, ninth, Ellis, tenth, Wallace, eleventh, Parsons, twelve, Allison, as they unlimber them again here at Richmond. Nobody hurt, a lot of cars badly banged up in that altercation. I think this is what Darrell Walter's been waiting for all day long, is a little clear track to run on. They're reporting nine cars in that wreck. Nine cars are in that altercation. Out of it, Darrell Walter taking the lead for the first time. Remember, he was a back-to-back -back winner on this track. Kyle Petty, the man, to try to do it this year after he won in that surprise last year, coming from fifth to win it in the last lap after a last lap wreck eliminated the man you're now watching in the lead along with Earnhardt. Here's Chris Economac. I'm with Bobby Allison's pit. He has been in and out of this pit five times during that yellow flag period for repairs. The last time to get the front end of the line. And he is in the same lap with the leader. The crew here has done a magnificent job for the former champion. Back to you again. Thank you, Chris. One lap down. Car 21 that's running just behind the leader, Walter. That's the 17 car up in front. The 21 car, last year's winner, is a lap down. He is now being challenged a little on the outside, pulling around him as Bodine in the second spot. There's the 17 in front, and then that second spot is now Bodine. Here's Jerry Garrett. Well, Ken, we're down here in Darrell Walter's pit, and he may be leading this race, but there's trouble on his race car. The crew just went and got this, a differential out of the truck. They may have to change the rear end. He's reporting some high temperatures out there. Well, that's bad news. Just exactly what you don't need. The interval first to second, shrinking up a little. Bodine tries to close in. Earnhardt in third, Elliott in fourth. In the left, then Terry Labonte was in the lead lap. Shown as fifth. Walter, where he wants to be, well out in front, and from the viewpoint of Benny Parsons, taking another look from that Superflow Exxon car, Parsons, after that altercation, being shown in 12th position. We're trying to get the story, but we thought he ran the stop sign down here, and I think his vision was blind. I wonder what the NASCAR ruling is, if either Chris Economaki or uh, Jerry Garrett can get to that from crew chief Harry Hyde, it would be appreciated. There is the 35 car being shown at this time as the 12th position runner. Number 17, Waltrip stays in front. Bodine trying to close, and Bodine will have his hands full shortly with number three, Earnhardt. One hundred sixty-one laps are complete, and we'll be back with more of the action. From Richmond Fairgrounds, Darrell Waltrip leading the Richmond 400. Potential rear end problem there for Waltrip, but that's not the only potential problem he's got. Let's get right back to the action. Indeed, on the inside, Earnhardt moving around Bodine. Now is trying to collect Darrell Waltrip. Here they are on a turn number four, war for first place. These are the two that got into that terrible brouhaha last year, the last lap, and both ended up in the wall. For the moment, it is Earnhardt on the inside, and he's beneath Darrell Waltrip and taking the spot away. Waltrip closing up again as they go down the back straightaway. Earnhardt is now willing to say, hey, last year I just plain made a mistake and wants to let it go at that. I wonder if there's anything building in Darrell Waltrip's mind as he watches that move on the inside. At number three, Flat has the horsepower and the handle at this point. And the 1980-81 winner of the event, Waltrip, now looks from second place at this Richmond 400. Closing in on him is Bodine in third. Elliott's in fourth. Labonte fifth. Kowicki sixth. Gant seventh. Marcus eighth. Wallace ninth. Marlin tenth. Eleventh is Allison. Twelfth is Kyle Petty. Thirteenth, Bobby Hillen. And fourteenth, Benny Parsons with fifteenth, Mike Waltrip. Action-packed afternoon, sellout house here in Richmond as this $17 million Winston Cup Tour comes to what is usually its second stop right now. Rockingham before they could get here this year because of the immense amount of snow that week after the Daytona 500. And, of course, last week it was this man, number three, now with the lead, Earnhardt, who put it on him. Dale Earnhardt. 
the old advertisement said, one tough customer, and indeed he's proving to be that this afternoon. Absolutely. That race team came to the racetrack prepared to go fast, and they have ever since they've been here. One altercation, they didn't let it, let a major altercation put them back. Those guys brought the car back, and it is running, running, running. Let's, let's go down to the pits for a moment. Okay, I'm here with Ricky Rudd. Ricky, you were involved in that accident, but your car doesn't look all that badly damaged, but you're out of the race. What's wrong with it? Well, what really happened, right before the wreck, we started smoking. Come to find out, we had a hole rubbed in the oil pan. So the wreck, I really didn't get in the wreck. I stopped. It got banged up just a little bit, but I noticed the oil coming out from under the car, so I didn't crank it. Come to find out, the damage was done before the wreck. Did you see the wreck, and why did it happen? Well, when I got there, there was cars spinning everywhere. I couldn't really see what triggered it. What, how's the track? Track's in good shape. Uh, we just missed the handling setup in the beginning. We were making adjustments on the last stop. We never really got a chance to see how it do after the adjustment. Better luck next time. That's from Ricky Rudd. Back to you, Cass. A hard day for Ricky Rudd. Guy who is highly liked here. Got a great ovation from this crowd when he was introduced today. Tremendous Virginia driver in the Bud Moore car. But experiencing difficulties that have made him a bystander. Number three, Earnhardt with the advantage. Waltrip in second. 176 laps are now complete of the 400 to be run on this half-mile track for some $339,000 today. I think it's very complimentary of all the drivers. You've got several cars there all going for the, you know, running right there with the leader. Jerry Garrett is standing by with the crew chief for Benny Parsons today. Harry Hyde. Harry, what's the situation on Benny's car now? Is he down a lap? We're down one lap. Uh, he's running as fast as anybody, but the traffic is pretty hard on him. Uh, if we get a break in the traffic, we'll come back. The NASCAR hold you for a lap? Well, they were going to, and uh, we just went ahead and sat in here a lap and fixed it. We knew they were going to. OK, well, that's the situation on Benny Parsons. Still running, but beat up. There you see the 75 car, which is a lap down or so to him. Benny Parsons, who has not competed here at Richmond since, since 82. Uh, and he won this race, of course, back in 1978 in that uh, tremendous battle with Lenny Pond. Chris Economaki standing by with one of the all-time giants of American racing. Down here with Richard Petty, uh, patiently waiting for his car to be repaired. One of Richard's favorite lines is that you may give out, but you never give up. Richard, how, how much work has to be done on the car? Well, I think you've got to put a whole new right front corner in her. A-frames and smell and all that stuff. But I didn't get out to see, but it looks like pretty good damage. You going to wait it out? Well, according to how far they get along. If they can get it done, you know, in 15, 20 minutes, we'll probably go back out. It takes too long with this to get it. Okay, and where's the McKay? This is one of the times when the crews really earn their living. They got to go in there on a wreck like this when the guys are running for the championship to get those points. They they can't wait till that car cools down. They can't wait to get all the precise equipment they need. They can't wait for everything to be just right. They have to just dive right in there where it's hot, it's dirty, it's nasty, and they have to no waste no time in doing it to get that car back out to get those valuable Winston Cup points. You get scalded, you get burned, and you get no credit. Tough life, but they love it. Up in front, bar number three, Dale Earnhardt, defending champion of this entire series, leading Darrell Waltrip, three-time champion. What a battle that could be if these two stay together. You know the Fenders will fly. Bodine is back there in third. Bill Elliott is in fourth. The man for my money right now is Harry Gant in the 33. Gant, who uh, started up in the front row, has really been coming on this afternoon. He's fallen back after these pit stops. And he is having a pretty good go right now with Alan Kowicki. There's that leader trying to get through traffic, moving around Slick Johnson. There's Kowicki in the number seven car in six. Harry Gant, number 33, is in seven. If you remember, when Harry got in trouble, it was with him and Earnhardt were wrestling for the lead. And he wound up, same situation that Dale faced at the first of the race, being at the back of the pack and now having to work his way all the way through the field to get back up there in contention. Leaders another time with Earnhardt and Waltrip on the point. 185 laps are down at Richmond this afternoon. It's a dandy battle. And we'll be back with Virginia. Capacity house. Every seat gone days before the event. Watching this man, number three, Dale Earnhardt, now trying to fend off the number 17, Darrell Waltrip. 
Earlier this year, car number 17, Waltrip driver, was talking about the season and said, look out, the shark is back. And Earnhardt retorted, I'm ready to go fishing. Right now, it's Waltrip who's trying to fish first place back from Dale Earnhardt. Now, here's a guy who is really doing well in a short track. Bill Elliott's short track program has never been that strong. The best short track car he ever had, he brought here two years ago after he won Daytona, and it was destroyed in a terrible crash up here in turn number four. Right now, he's running fourth. That equals his best finish in this event. He was fourth back here in 1984. Been running here since 82. Short tracks are not the stoutest place for the Elliott Racing Team, but right now they're fourth position, and it looks like Elliott's playing his kind of game on this racetrack. Waiting on folks, staying clear of things. Still a long way to go. We're just about six laps away from the halfway point. This is the car in which he went over the fence a year ago at Watkins Glen, New York. Right clean out of the park up at Watkins Glen. Bill Elliott has an advantage down there in his pit area. A guy by the name of Ivan Baldwin, if you were with us at the end of last season at Riverside, California, in the preliminary race there, Bill drove one of Ivan's cars on the road course and liked the deal so much, he said, Ivan, why don't you come back to the North Georgia Mountains and live with, uh, live with my crew and go to work for me? Ivan is an absolute West Coast terror. He knows how to build good race cars, and Bill Elliott is as optimistic about his 87 short track prospect as he has ever been about anything in his career. And it's because of Ivan Baldwin. He's helping him set those cars up, working on the chassis. The other thing that has done for Elliott is relieved him of some of that responsibility. Through all the years of his career, he has been his own chassis man, and he's very good at it, but now he has some help, and that lets him get a little more focused on the driving responsibility. And here in Richmond, man, you don't want to be focused on anything else. Elliott is using almost an entire West Coast crew other than the folks he has in Georgia. He won't hire anybody out of that North Carolina group. Just doesn't want to let his secrets out. Now you're back once again with the Benny Parsons car, that Superflow Exxon machine, which continues to have its own problems now in 14th after that big razzle-dazzle here in the main straightaway. Lost the lap as it overshot the stop sign. At the end of pit road, but I thought he was blind. I mean, he had the whole hood up. They were trying to do work on it, not lose a lap. Not only that, there's just so much going on after a wreck like that. You're trying to gather your thoughts and try to figure out the best thing to do to recoup. Ah, there is the Harry Hyde prepared car. Halfway in the event. We are halfway. At the halfway point, as Parsons continues to try to throttle up through traffic. Here are our leaders. Number three, Earnhardt is in first. Number 17, Darrell Waltrip is in second. And just a couple of car lengths behind, there he is in third, Jeff Bodine. Those are the front three running within a straightaway of each other on his half-mile track at 200 laps. The fourth position car is Bill Elliott, of whom we've been speaking. Then in fifth is Terry Labonte. Six is Marcus. Now, Marcus is moving up a bit here. Marcus has come to six. Gant has stepped up to seventh, and Alan Kowicki has dropped back to in the eighth position. Rusty Wallace is ninth. Sterling Marlin at halfway is tenth. Eleventh is Allison, and twelfth is Kyle Petty. We'll try to get you a little better rundown here on our halfway report uh, very shortly. But that's how they came across the line at 200 laps. What's the most important aspect of racing at Richmond? Dave Despain says it's getting around the guy in front of you. When Dale Earnhardt clipped Darrell Waltrip on the last lap here last year and crashed both cars, it cost both drivers a chance to win, and it demonstrated the importance of picking the right place to pass on the tight Richmond Oval. Coming out of both turns is a good place. Uh, if you can get up under a guy and get a fender alongside of him, then you can usually hold him off till you get down to the next turn. Coming out of turn two, the excellent place to pass. Catch a guy out of shape there, drive under him, and then hold him off to the third turn down here. A lot like I tried to do last year to win this race. But uh, there's some body slamming that goes on here. Everybody's prepared for it. I know I'm going to get a little of it, and I know I'm going to give a little of it. So uh, that's, that's the deal here. It's a give and take. You get knocked sideways one lap, and you get to knock somebody sideways the next lap. So I like that kind of racing as long as it don't get out of hand. There are the three leaders. It got a little out of hand here shortly before the halfway mark, and we stacked them up like cordwood in the main straightaway. They're back underway at the present time, and there are the front three. Earnhardt, 
who has been in three altercations today, driven out of them, and just keeps relentlessly searching for his second victory of 1987. Dave Marcus at this point in the race is moving up pretty steady. I'm very impressed with the run that he's making. He is put, closing the gap on the front four cars at a, at a fairly consistent rate. Waltrip trying to close into that leader again, Lake. Lake Speed alongside, I'm Kent Squire. Right above the start finish line at the old Richmond Fairground, the heart of American racing. Virginia has race fans like for oh, one car Davey in Allison the wall. In the wall. Allison has socked the wall at turn number four. That'll bring out the caution. Davey Allison with the Rainier Lundy racing team. The youngster who made history at Daytona this year as a rookie flanking his colors for Rainier Lundy in the front row for the most prestigious stock car race in the world, the Great American Race, slaps the wall up here in turn number four. Rookie Davey Allison comes in. Let's have a look and replay. Perhaps spot what happened here. Watching and replay. The 27 car. Now it's up here in turn four. He was already in the wall. I think it, I think the back end just came around on him. I don't think he got helped. This place, when you've been running for quite some time, gets very slippery. Well, we're under caution. Fourth one of the day. Comes at lap at 209. More from Richmond after these words. Flag here as Davy Allison smacks the wall at lap 212. Gives us an opportunity for our Valvoline mid-race recap. Let's go back to the 200-lap mark and take a look at the standings as Earnhardt and Waltrip were in a tremendous battle. Remember, these are the 200-lap standings, and we'd like to take you back a little deeper in the field, give you an opportunity to see how some of your favorites were running at the midway point here in the Richmond 400. Jeff Bodine and Bill Elliott were the fourth and fifth place cars at that time. Terry Labonte, I checked that third and fourth with Labonte fifth. Marcus Gant, Cole Wicke, the pole sitter, falling back into eighth spot. Sterling Marlin, your 10th place driver at that point in the event. We are now past that midway point as we look at the next five. Bobby Allison was involved in that big crash earlier, as was Benny Parsons. Mike Waltrip got stopped on the racetrack when he was involved in an earlier altercation. He is now in 15th position and still running. Want to take a look at the major highlight, the major incident in the event thus far. In replay, we'll see the big tangle here. We ran almost the first quarter of the race without a yellow flag, but when the action came, it came in a big way. Into the outside wall goes Morgan Shepard. He takes Bobby Allison. That's Benny Parsons Hood flying up, and behind him a total of nine cars piled up in the event. And that has led to a significant amount of the attrition here, although the majority of those cars have been repaired and are back into competition. The car's out of the race as we go back to green now. Waywack Ulrich, the rookie Steve Crispin, Tommy Ellis, Ricky Rudd out of the race. He just missed that big wreck, but had to retire anyway with a problem. We are back under green as we wrap up our Valvoline mid-race recap. And the leaders are having at it. Dale Earnhardt is hooked up in a struggle for the lead with Bill Elliott. Let's go back to Ken Squire. Chevrolet versus Ford for the lead at lap 215. Earnhardt as tough as they come out in front and he's being chased now by Bill Elliott. What a job by Elliott here on this track. Bill Elliott looking really strong as they continue to sort them out now. Back straight away there's a fairly big interval back to the third place car in this field which is Terry Labonte's car number 11. He is back about 20 car lengths from these two leaders. They come down the main straightaway. Elliott looks like he has the handle to get down to the inside, but it doesn't work there as Earnhardt's able to scramble on the bottom and stay with it. Jerry Garrett is standing by with a car that has just gone back behind the wall. Harry Gantz, number 33. Harry, I thought when you are making that pit stop, getting new tires finally, you were really going to come out of there. What happened? Transmission busted. That's pretty frustrating. Three DNFs in a row this season. I guess I'm just too hard on the equipment. This guy's obviously disappointed. Three DNFs in a row probably means he's out of the champion chase for this year. Oh, uh, that is a tough one. Of course, there's still hope they, they desperately need to win to get back in that winner's circle program. And they came loaded for bear here today. They really intended to pull this one off. Not to be. Transmission dropping them by the wayside. Further back in the field, 11th position, that car number 71. That's Marcus. 
Dave Marcus, two-time winner here. We talked about Kowicki so much at the front of the show, and it reminds me that way back in the early 70s, it was Marcus who won the pole for this race. One of the biggest qualifying upsets in the 70s. And that day, Marcus managed to come on and finish fifth here at Richmond. I wonder if Kowicki will match that today. Kowicki is currently in seventh place. Number 71, Dave Marcus, doing an outstanding job. Here's Chris Economaki. When that yellow flag came out, Dale Earnhardt and Darrell Walter, who pitched their side by side here, came in bumper to bumper. Well, you can see where they are on the track now, the difference in the pitch work. We noticed Walter's car steaming a little bit. We, we spoke to Waddell Wilson. He's delighted to see it. It may be that Darrell Walter's car is beginning to overheat. Back to you. The two leaders, and just coming into the frame there for a moment, you saw Labonte. That's the universe. He is back about 30 car lengths of these two guys, Labonte who continue to battle up in front, and Bill Elliott is having at it. His car, number nine, working as well as it has ever worked on a short track, as he pulls right in on Earnhardt, and that Ford, aerodynamics don't count for much here, but horsepower does, and that's what Ernie Elliott delivers. Ken, let me pull together a, a couple of items here that I think are significant in the commentary as we watch here. Uh, let's take a moment to talk about the action because we've got Bill Elliott going down to the inside. That's the place to pass at Richmond. He's got the fender in. Let's see if he can make the move. He pushes Earnhardt out to the outside. Earnhardt tries to muscle back underneath, pushing and shoving, and the Ford has the nose out front. Oh, and they're at it again as they head out onto the back stretch. Ken, we're going to come back to that other story later. This is too good to miss. Number nine, Elliott, bottom side, high side, Earnhardt, wheel to wheel. This is one of those old-fashioned short track, put your teeth in your pocket, put grandma, it's going to be a rope. Back to turn number one. Earnhardt trying to pinch him down. There was Petty on the inside. Use anything you can find to try to hold that man. Even a car coming off pit road. But there's no holding Elliott at the moment. He stays at the bottom. And look at the handle on number three. It works on the outside. Another lap, wheel to wheel. Even for the moment, Elliott's there. Here comes Earnhardt, pounding that Chevrolet back on the high side. Doesn't get any better than this. It's fantastic. Bill Elliott in the board. And Dale Earnhardt bobbling just a bit in turn number two. It's so slippery on the outside of turn two and so rough on the inside. Just about impossible to get through at the speeds they attain and moving up all the time. Number 11, Terry Labonte there. Let's not discount Labonte. Junior Johnson's car. That one's going to be tough before the day is over. You got to give them credit for being a lap down earlier. Terry made a tremendous move and got a lap back on the caution. And here he is right there going for the win. Lake Bill Elliott says if you're going to run a racetrack where crashing is common, bring a car that's no stranger to crashing. <laughs> that's a good idea. Well, this car has been run several times. It's the one that went over the wall at Watkins Lens. It's nothing new to accident, so if it gets up on the wall, it won't hurt a thing. As I mentioned, that's the car. He went over the wall at 140 miles an hour at Watkins Glen, New York, on the road course a year ago. So this car is very familiar with the repercussions of barriers and so forth. Short track veterans, which you Oh, you got it. Well, it's a big day back in the Dawsonville Pool Hall, but for the moment, here comes Earnhardt, banging on that back fender. Today is not over yet, I think. Uh -uh. The fresh tires, one car may have a little advantage, and then as the tires come up to temperature, you see the chassis set up come back into effect. Look at that move by Earnhardt. I mean, he had about three inches to hit it right, and he nailed it. He's back there again. Now it's... Bill Elliott on the high side around turn number two, and that Ford seems to like it out there. It pulls away, half a car length, maybe five feet. Back comes Earnhardt. You're watching it live on the Superstation. As the commercial says, it doesn't get any better than this. All the while, Terry Labonte is back there licking his chops, saying, you guys just keep burning your tires up. I love it. I'll just watch you. And they are burning rubber up here. Now, remember, the cars did weigh 3,700 pounds a year ago. They're 3,500 pounds, and that 200 pounds of weight on these instruments makes an incredible difference. Well, neither, ca pounds, neither car is getting to run the line that he really wants to right now. Both of them are having to compromise, so it takes a little extra wear and tear on the brakes and the tires. And that can cause you to take a while before the car can come back, even after you do get lined back up. The 1985 winner, Dale Earnhardt, has his hands filled with Million Dollar Bill. Elliott on the outside, that Ford working so well. Still, he's taking out of eight straight away. Remember that in third spot, the battle continues, is Labonte, Waltrip is in fourth, Bodine is in fifth, sixth is Wallace, seventh, Kulwicki. 
You just wait for impending disaster out here. We've had nine cars today running that lead lap. Nine. There are 233 laps complete. There's Earnhardt back to the inside, and he's going to, for the moment, go back out in front. Let's see what Elliott will do about that. Elliott may be ready to let him run a little here. I wouldn't be a bit surprised if both of them weren't really wishing that one or the other would get back out in the front so they could give their cars a little bit of a break. If they get there and abuse their tires too much, one of the guys behind them may wind up running them down and putting them away before the end of the, to the next caution and get more tires. This may be the opportunity for two for Terry Labonte because he closed up on that lead battle when they ran side by side. There's no way you can pass two cars at once here. Labonte seems to have his hands full for the moment with Kyle Petty back in the lap down. But this will be the time where we'll see if Labonte really has something to offer those leaders. He had closed right up on them. Now they're single file. They're content to run that way for a while. Let's see if Labonte can get to the front or if he's got a third place car for now. There's the number 11, Labonte third position. Junior Johnson car, very familiar with short track. Obviously right now, Kyle Petty may have the best car on the track. He's one lap down, but he can get his lap back if he can get about two more positions and just about 150 feet. That's a long, long way to go. When you've got Dale Earnhardt and Bill Elliott covering that 150 feet, you're not wrong. He's talking about 150 feet, like just drive on up through. We call that a DMZ. <laughs> Car numbers three and nine. One and two. Earnhardt first. Elliott second. Great performance by Elliott. Everyone knows how well and how easy he runs those super speedways. He is still ecstatic because this past week, his 89-year-old grandmother got her fondest wish. Got a ride in a helicopter and got to see the old family homestead up there in Dawsonville, Georgia. Both grandmothers are watching today. Grandma Elliott and Grandma Reese. They're both experts in this game. I wonder how they're seeing this as Earnhardt leads by five car lengths. We'll see more of it here on the Super Station. Richmond, Virginia. He's leading the Richmond 400. Heavy hitters up front. Earnhardt, Elliott, Labonte, Waltrip. Three of them former short track winners. Elliott, of course, has never won on the short track, but he's the super speedway king. Big questions about what's going on with Darrell Waltrip. He's back and forth, potential car problems there. We'll find out more about that as we get back to the action with Ken Squire. Ken will be back uh, momentarily. Meanwhile, we've got uh, the continuing story of Dale Earnhardt up front. I'm sure Ken didn't get too far away from this action. Earnhardt is your race leader. The car beat up and bent up. If you've just joined us, let's recap a little bit of how we came to this point in the event. Earnhardt, very early, first 20 laps of the race, got down into the dirt, spun the car out, and fell all the way to the tail end. Has had to come back all the way through traffic, but now One, two, is three, four, five. leading the race, and leading it very handily after a challenge just a few laps ago by Bill Elliott. Let's get back to Ken. 248 laps are now complete. Car number three staying out in front by now some 20 car lengths is Earnhardt over the number nine of Bill Elliott. And then it is about another 30 car lengths back to what is now third place, Darrell Waltrip, who has taken the position away from Terry Labonte. He falls to fourth. In the fifth position, Bodine, uh, maybe another 20 car lengths back. Sixth position is Rusty Wallace, and seventh is Alan Kowicki. That Kowicki car continues to stay up in there and give it his best shot today. Jerry Garrett has this report from Darrell Waltrip's pit. Well, Ken, the rear end temperatures in Waltrip's car remain high, but they're not rising, but they're ready down here. Along with this rear end we showed you earlier has now been joined by a can of rear end grease and two axle gaskets. So they're going to be ready to put these things on right here in the pit area if those temperatures rise and that rear end give out. Thank you very much. Issue is rear end, Waltrip's car, can it go the distance from here with 251 complete? Less than 150 laps to the finish. Nine cars in the lead lap. The last car in the lead lap, number 44, which is Marlin. 
There's Dale Earnhardt back out front. You can see all that damage on the right-hand side of that automobile from the bumping and banging, the altercations that are so much a part of this short track game. Earnhardt plays that game as well as anybody out there. And right now, he is firmly in command. Waltrip, of course, sitting on that loaded time bomb with the potential rear end problem. And he is not able to make any kind of a challenge. Obviously, he doesn't want to run up there and challenge Earnhardt at this point because there's still a lot of laps to go. Dale Earnhardt literally out here for a Sunday afternoon ride. We note some clouds back over turn four. Could become an issue. The Grand National Division of NASCAR was scheduled to race west of here today. That race was rained out, and there has been fear that the clouds and the rain might get here before the end of this race. Boy, that may be part of the reason that Earnhardt wants to stick that car out front and keep it here. If the showers come, that could be the place to be. Slipping and sliding here, and then we get well into this race. The car number 27, Rusty Wallace, he is maintaining six, and Alan Kowicki directly to look at the damage to Wallace's car. Boy, that thing has taken some abuse today. The bear has been chewed on a little. Alan Kowicki is right there in car number seven, trying to close up on him. Directly behind that pair at the present time, I think is the 35 car, which is a lap down. Indeed, that's the case, the Folgers car of uh, Benny Parsons is running right behind. And now look at Kowicki and number seven take the Ford to the bottom of the racetrack and move on the Pontiac, number 27, Rusty Wallace. Scramble further back in the field. Sixth position in question here. See the hood is gone on Parsons. Number 35, the Rick Hendricks stable car. Number seven, Kowicki is in another position. He is up to six. Wallace drops to seven. And the story is that Parsons is a lap down in the Folgers car, running in 13th position. 258 laps will be complete this time by as Dale Earnhardt tries to repeat what he did in 1985 at Richmond. Waltrip has just scooted around Bill Elliott as if the tires are going away on Elliott's car. And there you see the interval between number 17, that's Waltrip, and the third place car, now Bill Elliott, as still Earnhardt leads. Sometimes the, the uh, stagger bill is a, is a, plays a key role here. The guys may start out right after a pit stop with the ideal stagger. Their tires may change. The stagger may go away. Somebody else may not start out with what they really think they ought to have, but as the stagger changes, it may come to them. Let's go to Chris Economaki. I'm John with Bill Elliott, and Chad, his brother Ernie. Ernie Bill is looking pretty good today, but he's just starting to slow down a little bit. Is there a problem with the car? No, oh, we're still making those guns. It's the first time we've run the car. We just got to work everything out. You got one more. You got one more stop, right? Okay, there you go. They have one more stop. He seems to be very confident, but he was smiling before, and he's not smiling now. Back to you, Ken. 266 laps are complete. At the 266 mark, Earnhardt looks pretty tough out here. Out of turn four and down the main straightaway. Trying to draw away, and he is getting himself about a quarter of a lap lead on number 17, Waltrip. There's the number three, 85 champion here at Richmond. He won last time out at Rockingham, North Carolina. Trying to put two weekends in a row together. There is the second place car, Darrell Waltrip. Waltrip says that racing at Richmond calls for some very unusual driving techniques. It's a it's a it's a controlled crash. Uh, you know, you got the throttle here, and these engines have a lot of power. So sometimes you have to hit the throttle uh, to make the car turn. Uh, sometimes you're headed right for a guy and you got the little bit of brake on and that it's like being on ice. You put the brake on, the car wants to go straight. And sometimes you got to let off the brake and hit the gas a little bit, like on a dirt track, to actually get the car turned to keep from running over somebody. Darrell Waltrip, about some of the difficulties of running this race racetrack, and we've seen some of the ramifications if you don't get it right. It's awfully easy to get in the fences on this facility. When the pitches are as close as they are here, that just doubles the problem. Remember, it's 60 feet wide in the back straightaway, and it's 40 feet wide in the front straightaway. It really narrows down. It becomes a funnel as you approach turn one. That's Benny Parsons and a bunch of them that went down in that bottleneck a little while ago and couldn't find a way out. 
Earnhardt, number three, has a three, three and a half second advantage over Waltrip in second. Elliott's third, Bodine is fourth, Terry Labonte fifth, Alan Kowicki in sixth. Rusty Wallace is seventh, Bobby Allison eighth, Sterling Marlin ninth, Kyle Petty tenth. Marcus is 11th, Benny Parsons 12th, Bobby Hill in 13th, and Mike Waltrip in 14th, Neil Bonnet 50th. Darrell Waltrip knows about unusual driving styles at Richmond. The, the key to his success, not only here, but on all of the short tracks, is his understanding of how to make the car work. Darrell told us earlier this week that when they debuted the new team, he and Waddell Wilson, the king of the super speedways, now the crew chief, when they made their debut in the Daytona 500, Darrell Waltrip said, we got confused. I was telling... Waddell what I wanted, and Waddell was telling me what he wanted, and we got confused. That was his word. And they never got it right. And they came to Richmond, and Darrell said, I know what to do at Richmond. I know what I need here. I know how the car has to work. We're going to work together and get the right combination. In all of his years with Junior Johnson, the key to their short track prowess was the communication on the radio. Darrell talking to Junior. Here's what the car needs. The yellow flag comes out. They make the pit stop. They make the adjustment. The car got better all day. And we've seen him win here so many times on the short track with that technique. Now, it's a new cast of players, but the key player is the guy at the wheel of that car. And that car, if that rear end problem doesn't flare up, is going to get better right down to the checkered flag. Of course, the other major key player on that 17 is the man that owns it, the man that's not here, Rick Hendrick. They have said that he is a class individual and will have to wait some years to really judge if this multi-car team comes together. But if there's such a thing as a model car owner, he'd be one of them. And that was a quote from Bill France, the president of NASCAR, some time ago. Three different teams all running under that Hendrick banner. And as we see it today, he has one team in second place and the number five car of Bodine is running in fourth place, and the number 35 is in 12th place, Benny Parsons with the Folgers car. So that gives you some perspective about how tough he is in selecting people, not only to drive his cars, but to maintain them, to get them out and make them perform. Junior Johnson has said there ain't nobody going to control three different race teams and keep harmony among them. It's a little like trying to get the United States, Russia, and Iran to sit down and agree on something. So far, Hendrick has done it. We will see as the season progresses. You have to remember, in this sport, you've got an awful lot of very high-strung people. It takes a real skill to be able to mesh them all together and keep them in harmony. Looking on, Richard Childers watching number three. You saw Allison lap down to those leaders, showing still in our latest report nine cars in that lead lap with the man on the tail end of that. And I think he's just gone a lap down. And there are eight cars now on the lead lap. The number 44 has just been put a lap down, Sterling Marlin, by Earnhardt. So there are eight in the lead lap, and Waltrip is pulling up. He's within about three seconds of lapping Sterling Marlin, the second place car. Elliott's in third, Bodine is in fourth. We ran caution free for better than 100 laps. And then we had yellow fever for a while. Everywhere there was trouble in the racetrack. It settled down again, and as we get toward 300 complete, race is stable with Earnhardt and Waltrip as they were a year ago showing their colors. Surprise, Elliott hanging right in here, looking very tough this afternoon, still maintaining third. One of the real dark horses on the track, I think, or not really a dark horse, our guy that won the race last year. Kyle Petty had some problems, got a lap down, but he has been staying there consistently with Earnhardt. He is actually closing on Earnhardt. If he can go just a little longer, catch a caution, he's going to be back in contention to win this race. Lake the battle. There is Kyle Petty's number 21, and there's a good scramble developing between the 21 and the uh, 27 and 7 car again. There's Kyle. But the story for the moment would be the sixth place battle. Alan Kowicki and Rusty Wallace seem to have their own thing going this afternoon. Here they are, another time, down through turn two, and for the moment, Kowicki is there in the sixth position. Rusty Wallace is back in seventh. Rusty Wallace was so confident last night and this morning. He just said, we think we have our problems resolved, and we're going to bring this one home. Kowicki, the youngster that sat on the pole, 
he waited until the very last thing to qualify, and he amazed everyone with his run. A few people had had him on the watch and said he's going to be tough, but I don't think anyone thought that Alan Kowicki, with a car used up a week ago at Rockingham, running the same engine, which was common knowledge, was going to be the factor it has been today. In this sport today, you cannot tell what's going to happen. Kowicki told me that he had gone back to basics. He said, we didn't do anything fancy. They got together and said, look, we've just got to get back, so let's go right back to basic, which is the old Junior Johnson theory. You can over-massage yourself right out of this game. So there you see Alan Kowicki's car number seven, sixth position in the race, continuing to hold on and try to move up. We'll be back with more in a moment. TBS Sports' Benny Parsons was up at the broadcast booth. Today, he's at the wheel of car number 35, soldiering on an 11th spot after beating that car up pretty bad in a big smash-up earlier in the race. Hang in there, Benny. True value hard charger leaderboard. Kind of an interesting situation here. Remember the scoring system. You score points every lap. Five for first, four for second, third for three points, and then two for fourth and one for fifth. And it's produced an interesting lineup here. Daryl Waltrip is up at the top of the heap. He's run in the top three or four positions all day long. Harry Gant piled up a tremendous number of points by doing the same thing before he fell out of the race. Kowicki, the pole sitter, hanging in in third spot, even though, again, he's fallen outside the top five. Bodine has been consistent. Look at Dale Earnhardt. He is in fifth place in the true value standings, even though he's been leading the race for a long time, because earlier in the race, he was charging, but he was charging from the back. He was not in the top five. It's an interesting lineup that really looks very much different from the current race standings as Earnhardt sits out front with a big lead. Ken? Bodine has pulled himself up another spot. Jeff Bodine has pulled car number five. Gary Nelson prepared the machine into third, and Elliott has fallen to fourth. Earnhardt continuing to lead, 296 laps complete. A big story continuing to develop in this race around that Kowicki car. There's a three-car battle developing a little further back in the field. And there is Alan Kowicki now working on Terry Labonte. Labonte in the number 11, then comes Kowicki in the 7. Labonte in that 11 car, just barely in front, and there you see Rusty Wallace in it. Grand scrap. That is fifth, sixth, seventh. Terry Labonte is fifth. Kowicki is sixth. Rusty Wallace, seventh. Alan Kowicki giving a real go here today. You know, it's interesting. He reminds me, and there's the leader again, Dale Earnhardt. Kowicki reminds me just a bit of Marcus. Both Midwesterners, both very savvy guys. Both of them understand a lot about their race car. I think that's got a, a tremendous amount to, uh, to do with their success that they're having. And er, as we mentioned earlier, in the early 70s, it was Dave Marcus who pulled the surprise sitting down the pole here. Take a look at Rusty Wallace taking a shot down the inside and not being able to get underneath. Three-car battle has developed for fifth place. Terry Labonte there. He is tough to work on. That is Mr. Cool, the Iceman. Terry Labonte out of Corpus Christi, Texas. Stays there. Then Wisconsin. Alan Kowicki running right behind him in six. And then follows the number 27 out of Missouri, Rusty Wallace. I'll tell you one person that's not going to lean too hard on Rusty Wallace today is Ken Schrader. Although they've had a lot of battles, they're flying home together. Same airplane tonight. I think it's Wallace's plane talking about that today. If you want your ticket, you'd better not lean on me. Not too much anyway. Not too much anyway. There we go, Wallace, Rusty made a bit there. Wallace getting into the back of car number seven just a tad, just tickles him on the rear fender. Wants to make sure he's awake out there. And you can see that Wallace has had the left side of his car rumpled up out here today. Wallace going to the outside. 302 laps are now complete. It appears that both the cars behind him are a little bit quicker, but they can't figure out a way to get by. That's a big problem on these little tracks when there's no slippery. Hair comes down to the inside. Rusty Wallace now comes to the high side. And there's no room there. They're, they're using up everything on the outside in the short straightaway. Allen's trying to trying to hold Rusty off at the same time trying to attack Terry. And it's, you know, a very difficult situation. You lay yourself open if you go for the big hole sometimes. And it looks like the guy that has got it working right now is Wallace. He, he wants to get through there. He has the horsepower as they come off those straightaways. But he hasn't got any place to run. Looking for just that much more. Just a couple of inches of daylight. A little sideways that time in turn two. Fifth place is number 11, Terry Labonte, now with the Junior Johnson Racing Stable, where Darrell Waltrip carried the colors. 
Kowicki pulls back up again. And there's Wallace. Right behind that trio is Schrader. He's running a few laps down, showing now seven cars in the lead lap with a cutoff car, Wallace, in seventh position. Harry Gantz, number 33, is coming down pit road. Remember, they were in for a considerable length of time. They're back on pit road, trying to score some points and having trouble. I think they made garage car number 33. Meanwhile, the battle between 7 and 27 just gets stronger and tougher all the time. It's Wallace on the outside. Wallace picks up a spot. He goes up and takes that sixth position. Wallace claiming six and ready to close on Terry Labonte. I believe, I believe Rusty's finally figured out the way around is going to be on the outside because they're not going to let him buy on the inside. There's just no room there. It's so difficult. If you take the outside, it slips sliding away is the theme song. And if you take the inside, you feel like you're on a conga drum. It just bounces you all over out there. The inside really tough. Now Wallace hangs it up on the outside. There's the 11 sliding, throwing the block. And as he does, Wallace gets the inside back. Moving down, trying to throw the block again is number 11, but there's no room, and Wallace is picking up two positions here. The Bear, getting to get mean. Number 27, Rusty Wallace is in there. Pulls up on the back of number 81, Arrington. Several laps down and gets through him. Rusty Wallace now into fifth position. The front four, Earnhardt, Waltrip, Bodine, and Elliott in fourth. Battle for the moment resolved. 309 laps complete. There's your leader. Dale Earnhardt is out in front. Waltrip second, Bodine third, Elliott fourth, Wallace fifth, Labonte sixth, Kawicki seventh, Kyle Petty in eighth, Bobby Allison ninth, Dave Marcus is tenth, Benny Parsons has come back in that Folgers number 35 to 11th. He's about to go another lap down to the Earnhardt, to the Earnhardt car. At number 35, which was in that big nine-car crash out here in the main straightaway earlier. Bob Barsha is standing by with another GM Goodrich racing update. Here's Bob. Thanks, kids. The skies are getting gray here at Richmond, but down the road in Hickory, North Carolina, they opened up for the second week in a row. The NASCAR Grand National Sportsman cars have been rained out. They'll try it again next week in Hickory. At Daytona Beach, Florida, Rick Ryan and Ronnie Titchener, respectively, have won the Daytona Supercross and 125cc motocross titles. And Wayne Rainey has put his factory Honda into victory lane at the prestigious Daytona 200 Superbike race. Now, yesterday in the Nevada desert, the off-road racers spent a very eventful afternoon eating dust. Brought together the off-road stars near Las Vegas for the second of nine events in the SCORE HDRA series. Steve Kelly here passes Walker Evans for the win in the two-wheel drive truck class, while the father-son team of Bob and Robbie Gordon picked up their fifth win in six starts. But the finish of the day was in the mini truck class, where Manny Escara caught Roger Mears with just a quarter of a mile to go after Mears broke a wheel. But because Mears started 15 seconds behind Manny and managed to limp his three-wheeler home just eight seconds behind, he won the class by seven seconds in the best finish of the year. In sprint car racing, Ohio's Jack Houdenschild was the big World of Outlaws sprint winner at Chico, California. And in drag racing, three-time World Funny Car champ Raymond Beadle is the quickest qualifier as the big funny cars warm up out of the Texas Motorplex. They'll have eliminations today in preparation for the big NHRA Gator Nationals next weekend in Florida. That's it for this edition of the GM Goodwrench Motor Week Illustrated Racing Update. And we'll be back to Richmond right after this. Great Rankin for Raymond Beadle, doing well in drag racing, and his car runs fifth here right now at Richmond. More short American racing is this half-mile track of Richmond, Virginia, where Dale Earnhardt, at 321 of 400 laps complete, continues to show the way, but now his lead is being cut into by about three seconds. He leads number 17, Darrell Waltrip, in the second position. With third spot, there's the 17 in second. And then in third, about another three seconds back, is Jeff Bodine, also the Hendrick Racing Stable. In the pits, here's Chris Economaki. I'm, I'm in Dale Earnhardt's pit. We just checked with car owner Richard Childress about that final pit stop. He says they're down to the one can of gas requirement. When asked about tires, he smiled. He said, we'll have to see. The pit man can win or lose this race for men like Dale Earnhardt and Darrell Wolfe. Thank you. Indeed. 
That's always the story here. You talk about how important the pit crews are on those super speedways, but getting in and getting out on a half-mile track, if you can gain a second here and get in front of some traffic, it's all important, critical. Those pit crews play a big role here. Oh, got a spin on and a turn three. Car turn three. Car number 64 has backed across the track. That is the Elmo Langley Ooh, car. Ooh, big red. Gary Cranmore, and there is a tie-up. Another car, Neil Bonnet. Gets into that one hard. Front end gone on Bonnet. Richmond has not treated him well in the last three years. Turn two, car got hammered the Junior Johnson racing days, and now the Raymock car is sadly fresh. This is the track where Neil Bonnet won his very first race in Winston Cup competition. He really took a hit. Jerry Cranmore's car, number 64, had hit the wall, front and rear, and in replay, let's look what happened. 64 car, down there, the 75, collects it in the door, turns into the wall. Thank goodness he was sliding when he collected it. For sure, Richard Petty was lucky, he just threaded the needle and went right through. The possibility of trouble on the rear end of car 17 still looms heavy as the cloudiness that channels now this Richmond track. There are some problems down here. Here's Chris Economaki with an update. And Dale Earnhardt goes down to the pitch after getting four tires and a can of gasoline. This should be his last stop of the race. And uh, let's see how he stacks up against Dale Walter, who's right behind him. Back to you. 325 laps are complete. 325 down. 75 remain. We watch Labonte, Schrader, Mike Waltrip, all pitting now. Everybody taking this opportunity to come in, which would bring them home. They wouldn't have to pit again for fuel or rubber, unless there was a caution. And car number 75, Neil Bonnet, goes up on the hook for another time here at the Richmond Fairgrounds. Back with more after this. On Waltrip's car on pit road. Here's Chris Economaki. This is the third time Waltrip has been in under this particular yellow flag. They're jacking the car way up off the ground. There's a problem with the rear end. Now, what they can do with that problem at this point, other than pump grease into it, I don't know. But they've got the grease can there, about 20-pound can with a wobble pump, and they're pumping grease as much as they can into that center section. It must be red hot. It's a tough break for Dow Waltrip so late in the race here. And now here comes back down again. He's going to cost him several positions. These repeated stops. Back to you. Number 17 back underway. And it's Jeopardy the contest that Walter was playing here. Rear end on that car may be ready to cut loose at any time. And there you are once again with that Superflow Exxon camera in Benny Parsons number 35. Getting set to go. Oh, that camera and car took a tremendous hit in that main straightaway action. Benny down on the inside. He's two laps down to the leader. He'll try to get a lap back right here. Stacked up on the outside as we're ready for a go with 331 laps complete. Earnhardt first, Bodine second, Elliott third, Wallace in fourth, Kowicki. Wallace in fourth, Kowicki in fifth, Labonte is sixth. Uh, Darrell Waltrip is in seventh, Kyle Petty is in eighth, Mavi Allison in ninth. And from that Folgers car, we'll see them on the start here. There's Earnhardt scooting up on the outside. Bodine trying to run around him now. On the break, immediately jumping out in front. Earnhardt, another time. Bodine there in second. Bodine is such a strong short track runner. But remember, he cut his teeth in the modified ranks where they had no tennis. They had to be so careful about touching each other. Here's Benny Parsons working the Harry Hyde car. Down to the bottom. That Superflow Exxon camera giving that shot as they come out of turn number two. And notice the vibration there as they hammer across turn number two and back up for number three. Indeed, as we mentioned, that is Dale Earnhardt directly in front of car number 35. Danny Parsons. Earnhardt hitched up and trying to draw away from the field. Inside of the finish here this afternoon at Richmond. And Earnhardt drawing a solid bead on that lead. Elliott is in third, and he is ready to challenge. A battle beginning to develop for the third position. There it is. Number five, Jeff Bodine is there. 
And that is the battle for second. In the third spot is number nine, Bill Elliott. Fourth is Wallace. Fifth, Lamonti. Sixth, Colicky. If you remember on the last run after Cole's tires were put on the car, Bill's car ran very well. He worked his way up to the lead before easing back into the field. Whether or not that's a problem with the chassis setup or whether it was the tires or whether it's just Bill and them being cool, we won't know until the end of this thing. The speed into that last caution has been 82 miles per hour. We've had eight different leaders in this race, and that ties the record set back in 83 and in 86 four different drivers up in the front spot, each scoring five additional points. Jerry Garrett has a report. We're down here with Gary Nelson, the crew chief for Jeff Bodine. Jeff's been kind of up in the thick of it all day. He's second now. Can he go get Earnhardt or not? Well, I'll tell you, that number three car is awful strong. We kept him inside all day. Uh, just when we started running better, it cooled down, and that hurt us. Uh, we seem to run better in the longer run. So if this is the last caution, there's no more cautions until the end of the race. We've got a pretty good chance. If there is another caution, we're going to make some adjustments for a short run. Maybe we can get them there. Okay, well, you got a car there, Jeff Bodine, that runs better on hot tires. you got a car right next to him, Bill Elliott, that runs better on cold tires. Interesting matchup. Cars number five and nine continue their battle for second, but the man who was the story early is beginning to fall away. Car number 17 is definitely in trouble. Down the back straightaway, he may be getting ready to pit. Here he comes. Waltrip is coming in. Something is amiss on Darrell Waltrip's car. That rear end mine finally may have caved in. Obviously, it just caved. Let's go to Chris Economic. Well, Darrell Waltrip has cut the engine on number 17. The trunk is being lifted. And they're working now inside the car. Back here. What else looks, and it really looks like it's a rather major problem here. Walter is tapping on the door handle here. We've got too many men over the wall. Uh, what uh, what else is sending one of the men behind the wall so they don't get in trouble with the officials. And it looks like a tough break for Walter. Unfortunate moment for Darrell Waltrip. Such a strong short track runner. Here is Parsons again. That super flow X on camera down the main straightaway. Maintaining that interval he had earlier. There you see through that badly covered windshield with grime and rubber from this tough fight this afternoon at Richmond. He remember that he is running 11th in the Folgers car today, Benny Parsons. Now there's the battle for second. And there you see Bodine in the number five directly in front of the Ford being driven at Chevrolet versus Ford for second place and Chevy out in front. The car in front, Earnhardt, has clinched the five-point bonus for me leading the most laps in this race. When you look at these race cars on the track right now, it's for sure that aerodynamics doesn't play a tremendous role here at the half-mile track. 17 has come back on the track. Walter very slow around the racetrack, and he's still trying to score points and stay in the battle. It runs through 29 events culminating this year in Atlanta, Georgia. Battle for second continues. And Elliott begins to look stronger as if he wants to make that run that Lake Speed described earlier. 346 laps are complete inside of the checkered flag here in Richmond, Virginia. We'll be here for it on the Superstation. They are working on the back of that grit-stained car. Number seven looks like it needs a, a wash and a sponsored product out there at this point. Bad break for Waltrip. Meanwhile, strap up there. on the third turn back here. We've got cars all in the dirt. 67, Eddie Beerswale is in. No caution as yet. He's all the way down in the grass, and they may let her run. There he is on the bottom of the racetrack. The race continues, and the struggle for fourth continues to be a pretty good race this afternoon. Wallace and Labonte continue their own go. Here's car number 67 getting back into it, or trying to. Trying to. Yellow's coming out. 354 complete, less than 50 to go. 46 to go. 45 next time by. And with that, this will set up for a sprint. Let's see if anybody's going to gamble on coming on pit road late. This will give everybody a last shot at trying to get that set up ready to go for a sprint. Six cars in the lead lap. We're under caution once again at Richmond, setting up for a whale of a finale 
We'll be back for it right after this. Say, Mrs. Center. If Dale Earnhardt wins this race, the pit crew is going to get the credit. Remember, as we get back to the action here in just a moment, that car had the entire front end ripped off of it with a throttle suck, and he hit the wall full bore. Now we're back for what could be the final green flag run, and Dale Earnhardt with that rebuilt car is right back out front. Let's go back to Ken Squire to call the shot. All day yesterday, they did nothing but rebuild. No time to test, no time to shake it out. Absolutely right, David. It was an amazing performance by that Childress crew. And as they come back under that green fly condition, 360 complete, 40 to go. Earnhardt is drawing away from Jeff Bodine in second, and then comes in third, the number nine of Elliott. And with him, you see car number 11. And there's the 27, Wallace. Now, Wallace, in this last pit stop, among those leaders, was the only man to pit. He brought on four tires, went all the way around. The Superflow Exxon camera here showing you. He's right in front of Benny Parsons. Parsons is in 10. Give Harry Hyde and that Folgers crew credit. They have really thrust that car back into the action. Rusty and them took a gamble to get behind everybody, but it, it, it pay off for him if he can go ahead and get through the traffic now before the tires get hot. And as you then can he see. can take the advantage of it and sit there and hold his shot. He's trying to make that move now. If he doesn't get through the traffic, it will be all for no, no gain. A lot of cars, tremendous number. We'll count them down. Cars still running out here for you as we get 400 laps complete. There is Wallace on the outside making that move on Terry Labonte. And as you look at that, that is third, fourth, fifth. Number nine, Elliott is in third, and here comes Rusty Wallace. Hey, I guess he got sparked up a little when Raymond Beadle did so well in the drag racing, as Bob Barcher reported earlier today, and they are really coming on. Barry Dotson and company. Dotson, for my money, is one, and here, here he comes up on the inside. Elliott's number nine on the high side, and moving through traffic comes number 27. He has to back off. Rusty Wallace is such a savvy short track driver. He's another one that graduated from those Midwest tracks. And you get him on a half mile, he's tough. Bill Elliott didn't fall asleep either. He used, used that slow traffic to put, put Rusty back behind him. Now here's 17 pitting another time. Meanwhile, the battle is out there for 27 and 9. Black flag is on 17. Look at this fight. Down to the inside. Rusty Wallace presses his luck on the bottom of the racetrack, and Elliott stays with him. Dandy scramble. Just couldn't get a good bite off that corner down low over there where the tracks were washboarding. Here comes Terry Labonte back on the inside. Elliott stays third. Up in front, Earnhardt and Bodine. One and two. The struggle is right here at Richmond Live on the Superstation. This afternoon, it is a whirl of a war. And in that war, this guy has a weapon. Number 27, Rusty Wallace, took the gamble with his crew. They said, hey, none of the other leaders are coming in. Let's stop and grab four tires. Because if it's a rerun of what happened, here he goes down to the inside on Elliott again with the fresh tires. He's got good rubber all the way around, and he's making it work. Now, Elliott is still pretty strong on the outside, but Wallace took the gamble. None of the other leaders did it. They all waited to see what Earnhardt was going to do. It's the old monkey see, monkey do game. Nobody went in. Wallace's crew said, let's gamble. They came in and got the tires, and now they've gone from fifth to third. A great move on Elliott. Let's see if Wallace can run down the leader. Well, the move on Wallace's part, I think, was the one move he could make. He was the guy out back. He didn't have very much to lose. Those guys up in front trying to come up through traffic here is a tough one. If they had all come in, they would have been equal. Out back, kind of looking from the catbird seat, and they really called the right shot on that one. Nothing to lose and everything to gain. And if he plays his hard drive, he just, he just thinking, finesse, finesse, don't slip, don't abuse the tires, take advantage of what advantage we went in there and got. If he can play it to, to the hilt, he could win this thing. And of course, he won a couple of races last year. And he'll frankly admit his pit crew won the race at Bristol. In fact, they kid about it. They say, Wallace won one, and we won one last year. Well, they say the chain is as, weak, as strong as the weakest link. Earnhardt and Bodine out in front, and there's the man in third place trying to close it up with 370 laps down and 30 laps to go. And we'll be back for the exciting finale of the Richmond 400 live on the Superstation shortly. Of the pit area where the team's hopes have gone awry. That is the pit area of car number 17, Darrell Waltrip, who had such high hopes for today, ending with some 377 laps to go. They're back in the garage area, Waddell, Wilson, and company, and the driver, Darrell Waltrip. In the battle, 
on the track. Earnhardt and Bodine are one and two. Wallace is trying to close up. And here's where the scramble is. Bill Elliott in fourth is being challenged by Terry Lovato in car number 11. There's one car running very slowly down the main straightaway. 67 is up against the wall. It has not touched it, but Eddie Beerswell is really slow on the track. There he is. White front is down, throwing some sparks from beneath the track as we get to 378 laps complete. This will bring out a caution. Going back to the leader. That's car number three, and perhaps show you the interview here, interval between that first and second place car. Bodine is in second, and that has stayed stable between this man, car number three, and number five, right here, Jeff Bodine in the second position. And then closing on Bodine, lap after lap, the man to watch is the 27. He's only about 15 car lengths behind five. Rusty Wallace is the driver of the moment on the track. Here is number three, Earnhardt scrambling with some back markers, Arrington's car in front. Then you see the five, and following him comes Rusty Wallace. There's Wallace. Now watch him closing up here. Time is of the essence, 381 laps complete. And Rusty Wallace is trying to close in on car number five. Here he is in turn three, a very tricky turn. Yeah, they did it just right. In front, it's number three. Mike Earnhardt is going to win his second Richmond 400. It's around J.D. McDuffie. It's never over till it's over. I can remember that very well from the 500. Yes, Something about the fat lady, right? Now let's now let's take a look here again. As you see that interval, there is the Bodine car, and here closing on the inside comes Rusty Wallace. Uh, the bear has come out of hibernation at the end of this race. Car number 27 is on the attack. Make no mistake about it. That four-tire change was the absolute right move, really the only move he could make, but it's always a gamble to give up that position on track, unless you're the one out back. Here comes Wallace, and of course the word's gone out. You can see that interval stays about the same between. In fact, right now, I'd say Bodine has stretched it a little. That's second place, number five of Bodine. Bill Elliott's having his hands full. Terry Labonte has given him one fierce battle in that fourth position. Really they are decided to go for it. They're digging after one another, lap after lap. 385 laps complete. 385 complete. 15 laps to go. Bodine right there. There's the fourth place battle. Elliott. With this finish where he is right now, he will duplicate his best finish at Richmond in the 400. Several times now, Terry's had his nose up under Bill just to have lap traffic put him back in line, but he has really been working on him hard here lately. Just behind this pair is the man who sat on the pole, Alan Kulwicki, the number seven car. And when I say just behind, it's more than that. He's almost a third of a lap down to the duo battling for fourth place. Kyle Petty is seventh, Dave Marcus is eighth, Bobby Allison ninth. Now there's Alan Kowicki. Back in sixth position. Alan Kowicki, who made history here at Richmond, taking what was damaged property and putting it right on the pole. Earnhardt counting off the laps. Childress on the radio, every lap by, knocking another one down. Bobby Hillen is in 11th. Ken Schrader is in 12th. Michael Waltrip is 13th. And Jimmy Means is running in the 13th position. 12th is Schrader, 13th is Michael Waltrip, 14th is Means. Jimmy Means is 14th. Phil Parsons is in 15th. J.D. McDuffie in 16th. 10 to go. Here's the guy, who, of course, who took that big gamble in the uh, Daytona 500, Jeff Bodine. Nothing to gamble here. It's a matter of riding out the laps. It doesn't look like he's got the stuff to try to run down Dale Earnhardt. But remember, we heard Jerry Nelson and his crew chief say a few laps ago, as we count them down 10 to go now, that they might gamble on a late race setup for a sprint to try to rein him in. I don't think that they've got the combination they need to do that. But Bodine here with a good, strong run, demonstrating, again, the strength of the Hendrick team and also the fact that he was able to run well on the super speedways and run well on the short track. It's a 29 race season and the battle is for the championship, but this guy right here is the one everybody's got to be shooting at. They
Daytona 500. He had a car that could win, and now he won last week and may win again here today. 90 mile an hour average in the last lap on the leader, Earnhardt. 90 miles per hour on this half mile track, and the man who is moving is Bodai. He has pulled away from Rusty Wallace. Four new tires for car number 27 or no. It is Bodai, and he is trying to close in as the laps trickle down. 392 down, 393 this time, and seven to go. Sterling Marlin is running very slowly. Marlin in the 44 has fallen off the pace of recent and further back in the field. On the last count we had, Marlin Carr had fallen out of the top 15 and is struggling out here, just idling the bottom of the track. Right now, there you see what Jeff Wolfe out of Bodine was wanting to see. He wanted to see Dale Earnhardt get a little traffic to slow him down. Closing to within 12 car lengths. Jeff Bodine from Chamon, New York, closes on the defending Winston Cup champion Dale Earnhardt. Earnhardt draws away just a tad down the back straightaway. Wallace stays third. In fourth, it remains Elliott, and he has about five car lengths now on Terry Labonte as we get ready to sugar this one off. Five laps to go. Five to finish it this afternoon. Earnhardt looks like he's going back to back. He won at the Rock, now here in Richmond, Virginia, which is just as tough as that North Carolina Motor Speedway. He seems on his way again. Kowicki just tapped the back end of Allison's car, but was able to gather it up and keep going. Everybody getting a little tired. Those cars change shape at this time in a race. I'll tell you what, uh, looking through that windshield, you're really glad to get this thing over with. When you get down to this far and your car's beat all up, you're beat up, you want to get this thing over with. But you want to get it over with in one piece. Leaders, first and second, right here. Car number three, Earnhardt, with now three laps to go. Second place man, right there. Here, Jerry Garrett with Darrell Waltrip. Okay, we're down here with Darrell Walter, but I guess there's never a good time for a rear end to blow, but 40 laps to go is the worst, isn't it? Well, especially when the car was running as well as it was, and everything was going good. The crew was doing a good job, and I was having a good time, and I, I feel like we had the winning car today. It's the best car I ever drove here at Richmond. Just uh, tell everybody home high and thank the Lord for a safe day, and sorry I'm in here. Down for the final laps. A couple to go for Earnhardt. On his way. This will sprint him up in those point standings in front of Elliott by a pretty good margin. White flag is out on Earnhardt, on Bodine, on Wallace, Elliott, Labonte coming across the strike. Final lap for Dale Earnhardt. And right where he met disaster, waving in his last lap. Crash up in turn three. A crash in three, getting through it. There's Schrader in the wall, needling his way through. Comes Dale Earnhardt. He's going to win it after a car crashes. Two of them have crashed in turn number three, and he picked the right spot to move through and take it home. Well, Ken Schrader in the Judy Donlevy car out of Richmond, Virginia, has a last lap scrimmage with the wall, and he comes out short. There's first and second place coming across. Number three wins it. Number five, Bodine is second. It'll be Rusty Wallace with a great performance in third. Bill Elliott fourth. Terry Labonte fifth. Alan Kowicki sixth. Kyle Petty is in seventh. In the eighth position will be Dave Marcus. Ninth is Bobby Allison. And tenth is Benny Parsons. So we'll be going to Victory Lane to meet the winner today right after these messages. 400, two straight for Dale Earnhardt. Dale, you look a little worn out. How tough a race was it? Well, it wouldn't have been too tough, but uh, I had an accident yesterday morning. I'm off the sore in my neck and my back, but, uh, you know, Richard Childers and uh, them guys proved how, what kind of champions they are putting this race car back together. We totally lost it yesterday, and, you know, they said, let's fix this one, and I was wanting, sort of wanting to get the other car out, but they said, let's fix this, and we can win the race. I've been there if they wasn't right. Dale, after you came into the victory lane, I walked around the car. There's not a corner of it or a side of it that doesn't have a dent or a mark or a scratch or tire marks. You must have really been scrambling during the day. Well, the traffic was awful tough. Uh, you know, I spun out there first of the race trying to get under Allen, and, uh, and rather than rubbing him, I spun the car out, and, uh, you know, I tried to stay off of him. But, uh, you know, I just had to uh, work my way back to the front, and it was racing awful close. Uh, Elliot really had, uh, you know, he gave me a good run. Uh, he, he got in the left side pretty hard a couple times, but we raced side by side and didn't have any problems. So, you know, it was a good day. Uh, I got under Harry up there getting in three, and uh, I don't think he knew I was there, and it clipped him and spun him around. I hate that happen, but uh, Harry's running awful good. But uh, that's the only really incident all day that was involved with. It was really, you know, part of our fault. You're not the only one that's confident on the crew, Dale. Your crew worked till 7.30 last night, went home, went to bed. 
came back this morning and started working on the car and didn't finish until it was time to put it on the line. Weren't you worried that it might not be quite right after that bang-up yesterday? I got confidence in them guys, Chris. You know, they, they didn't get any practice last week at Rockingham, and uh, we won the race. We didn't get any practice here, and we won the race. I think we'll just stop practicing. <laughs> well, why not? How are you going to celebrate? We're going to go home and uh, get ready and, uh, you know, try to get to Atlanta a little early and do a little fishing down there. Good for you. Congratulations and good luck, Taylor Hunter, the Richmond 400 winner. Well, last year he won one million seven hundred thousand dollars, and Dale Earnhardt looks like he's on his way again with two back-to-back -back victories: the Rockingham North Carolina Motor Speedway coup a week ago, and then he comes to Richmond, and with a car that he crashed two days ago, puts it all back together and looked like it never missed a lick. The guys are hot; they're hot. But and I'll tell you what, this team came off the end of the year last year, blazing hot, winning the last race of the year. You know, just a championship, the whole thing. Now they've gone right back into it and picking up right where they left off. There you see the final standings. We'll be back with a lot more from Richmond right after these words. <laughs> 1985 is the runner-up again this year. Second place man Jeff Bodine is standing by with Jerry Gear. Well, Jeff, you were in the hunt all day, but right there at the end when you had a chance to make the pit stops and get new tires you just couldn't quite close that gap on Earnhardt. We never got the, the right setup. It was close. A little different car than we've run here before so we're happy with the way it ran but there's room for improvement. We think we can uh, we can do that. But we're real happy with finishing here. No engine problems. We avoided all the wrecks and we got a good finish out of it. It had, it had good pit stops and uh, you can't ask for much more than that here at Richmond except the win. But we'll be back and We'll work this chassis out and, and get a better setup for next time, but all well, Ironhead's pretty tough here. He's proved that he's tough all year, and uh, we're going to have to battle with him, I'm sure, but we're very happy with everything. Levi Garrett, excellent car, ran well. The crew worked good. Matthew, Barry, Sonia, I'll be home a little bit. Okay, happy runner-up, Jeff Bodine. The average speed this afternoon wasn't too far off the record, 81.521 miles an hour for 400 laps on this half-mile track. The record is 83.608 back in 1979 by Kale. So even though we suffered through six cautions of 36 laps when they ran, they really ran stout. I'm telling you, just the competition in Winston Cup racing nowadays is so thick. It goes so deep into the field that the cars have, you have to run hard all day. There's no more of this padding your, padding your way and waiting to the end of the race to race. You've got to run all day or you'll find yourself a lap down. Record crowd beginning to file out of this wonderful old racetrack, this old fairgrounds, which is where so much of race...